There's Spencer. <clears throat> there we go. Yes, we got him. I have one. All right, I'm seeing one, two, three, four, five. We have five with us. Are we waiting on Father John and Christy? I see Father John there. Sorry, I couldn't quite get, oh, I see Father John. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, well then I see we've got a sizable group. So I'm gonna go ahead and start off. We'll call the meeting to order at 6.01 p.m. This is a special meeting of the Isla Vista Community Services District. I'd like to announce this meeting is being recorded. And Jonathan, can you do a roll call? Yep, Director Brandt. Director Bertrand. Here. Director Freeman. Here. Director Geis. Here. Director Hedges. Here. Director Nguyen is not here. And Director Thurlow, happy birthday. Here. Thank you. <laughs> happy birthday, George. Happy birthday. Yeah, happy happy birthday. birthday. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge the Chumash people who are the traditional custodians of this land. We pay our respects to the Chumash elders, past, present, and future, <clears throat> who call this place, Maniscoyo, the land that Isla Vista sits upon, their home. We are proud to continue their tradition of coming together and growing as a community. We thank the Chumash community for their stewardship and support, and we look forward to strengthening our ties as we continue our relationship of mutual respect and understanding. So with that, uh, we have the consent agenda. Do any directors have items they'd wish to pull? Hearing none, I'll entertain a motion. I'll, I'll, move, move. I'll move the consent agenda. I'll second. Motion made by Geis, second by Bertrand. Is there any public comment? All right, we'll bring it back to the board. Jonathan, can you call the roll? Yes, Director Brett. Dr. Freeman. Yes. Director Bertrand. Yes. Director Hedges. Yes. Thurlow. Yes. 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 All right, motion passes. Now we're going to open public comment. So this is the time for any members of the public uh, to speak, if they'd like to speak on a subject that is not on the agenda today. Uh, the board's not gonna take action on any item that's not on the agenda except it's provided for by law. Any general public comments? I'm not hearing any. Um, so with that, we're gonna close the public comment period and go into our first item. The first item on the agenda is the County of Santa Barbara proposed houseless pallet village project. Uh, and I want to say a big thank you to uh, County Community Services Department staff uh, for joining us today. And I think I see Kimberly and Lucille on the line. Um, thanks for joining us. And I'll hand it over to Jonathan if uh, you have anything you want to introduce this item with. Yeah, I'm not gonna say anything right now. I can do it afterwards. I'll just pass it on to Kimberly and Lucille to take us into it. Excellent. Um, thank you for joining us, Kimberly and Lucille. Do you wanna maybe give a little bit of an overview and uh, if you have slides or anything, we can make it so you can share your, your screen, whatever works for you. Sure, I'm terrible at share screening, so I'm gonna... <laughs> I might have Lucille have to jump on for me, but um, anyway, I am Kimberly Albers, Albers, and I'm the Homeless Assistance Program Manager, and it's been a whirlwind of meetings, and I know several of you have seen these slides um, a few times, but um, for those of you who um, have not, I do think it's an important um, sort of to, to go through kind of methodically how we got here, and um, let's see, Jonathan, am I able to share, or who's... Yeah, let me let me turn on uh, your ability to share screen. And okay. I'm doing the talking, but many of you know that Lucille Boss has been working diligently with the IV working group and really is the expert here um, since May 
um, on the county side, trying to bring uh, additional resources to Isla Vista to address the encampments. And I want to thank uh, Father John, especially for his words, both in the Ivy Working Group last Friday and um, with the Board of Supervisors today, and just all of you that I've had a chance to um, visit with uh, individually about this project over the last um, month or so. So let's see, let me try again here. Let's see, here we go. I'm going to... How does that look? Oh, it looks like I have a, um, well, if you guys can ignore the side, <laughs> um, can you just see the slides or can you see the notes too? Only the slides. It looks okay, like great. It. All right. So um, again, we have been um, kind of give a little bit of background here. Um, we have been working on four key objectives throughout the COVID-19 emergency as part of the homelessness response. And um, Spencer, Ethan, Jonathan, I think many of you have participated in those calls really since we began in March. And so our four key objectives were really to prevent and mitigate COVID-19 impacts for persons who remain unsheltered. And that was um, primarily trying to reestablish access to showers, food, charging, hygiene supplies. We also were committed to increasing homelessness prevention and housing options um, to try and get as many people indoors as possible. And um, I'm excited to report tonight actually that um, as we went through a real dip as far as um, being able to house uh, persons experiencing homelessness during the emergency in September and October, the system of care has been averaging about 100 placements per month, um, which is an increase even pre-COVID um, because of those extra resources and we've had an emergency rental assistance program in place that hopefully everyone is aware of if they have um, individuals or families who've been impacted by COVID-19 and are having trouble paying their rent, um, that we do have emergency rental assistance available um, in the unincorporated areas of the county and over 294 households have been served so far with that. Sustaining existing shelter capacity we saw across California, many uh, congregate shelters went down in those first couple months of the, um, of the crisis. Um, they had outbreaks that resulted in their closure. And so a primary goal for us to was sustain existing shelter capacity by helping cover the costs of our congregate shelters. And then also establish non-congregate shelter, which we knew would also be a key part of addressing COVID-19 because we had so many of our homeless population that are medically fragile are over 65 years of age where they need, um, need that non-congregate uh, shelter. And so um, we certainly have seen a rise in encampments. And of course, some of that is because of the CDC guidance. And I think um, if you talk to someone experiencing homelessness, they would also share with you that they just um, maybe what was keeping them closer to um, storefronts and um, other areas and more dispersed was because um, they may have been um, accessing those, those um, talking to people at those locations or um, accessing services kind of indirectly through informal means and all of that went away. And so it really meant people kind of uh, hunkered down and went into um, a lot more encampment settings. So some of those Things that we've seen, like I said, are increasing encampments. So more camps and more persons in camps um, was a, a, a direct thing that we continue to see today that that's still an increasing number. And that because the camps are really not moving, um, we've seen this expanded footprint, right? So where before potentially one individual might have um, you know, a few belongings over the course of four or five months in the exact same location, um, that, that camp footprint just for one person might exceed like 20 feet. Um, so we're seeing that actually a lot in Montecito. And so Heal the Ocean actually does a canvassing of um, the camps and can really show us kind of quantitatively how um, the, the camp numbers are going up and the footprint of camps and those impacts. And so we actually use their mapping um, to help with our outreach efforts. 
And then we just had fire share that um, they had 37 fires so far as a result of encampment activity in 2020. And as you know, there's been um, you know, damage to parks and open spaces and uh, definitely water quality issues as well. So when we're thinking about addressing encampments, um, we receive many calls just to remove encampments across Santa Barbara County, but there are significant limitations to consider when addressing or removing encampments. And of course, one of those, right, is you just, if you're just moving people, they're just going to the, to the next community. And so this public health emergency though, because of that Center for Disease Control guidance has made encampment management even more complicated and more challenging. So a summary of the Center for Disease Control considerations is that, you know, we really have to balance the risks uh, for each individual. And of course, um, one of the main things that um, we all hear quite often is the fact that the Center for Disease Control has asked that communities consider allowing encampments to remain where they are unless housing is available. And so um, they've also, um, provided some considerations for increased sanitation services and adequate distancing, which um, several of those have been implemented in Isla Vista with additional ADA restrooms, more hand washing. So right now, what we're seeing is as the stay at home order was implemented, um, you know, a large increase happened um, with, with people experiencing homelessness in the encampments. And this really has created an unsafe environment um, for the persons living in the camps, as well as for the community at large. Um, I think you're all aware now, I think that county fire went out and um, issued a notice uh, saying that there was a significant potential uh, for the life, uh, fire and life hazard conditions associated with the inspected homelessness encampments to adversely impact life, property, and the environment. Um, certainly concern for health and safety. I think um, one of the things that law enforcement has consistently no noted is that calls for service are going up in the area and that um, just a, a lot of um, need for um, better sanitation. And of course, uh, Rex and Parks has also experienced a deterioration of, of in the parks. So these are some of the things that um, that the county was part of assisting with. Um, certainly it's been a, a very much a team effort and um, so many people have, have contributed to this effort. Um, but some, these are some of the actions that have, um, have taken place so far. So again, I mentioned the installation of increased hygiene, more hygiene equipment, um, distribution of hygiene items, um, outreach teams addressing immediate health concerns, um, as well as environmental safety um, issues, general education about COVID. Um, you now have the showers of blessing in Isla Vista, I believe two days a week on Mondays and Fridays. Um, different feeding groups have, have stepped up, um, as well as connection to um, service providers, solar chargers, things like that. We had one uh, larger cleanup so far where actually quick response came in and um, took away, I think about two of those full roll offs of debris um, from, from primarily Anascoya, I think. And Lucille, you can jump in and catch me if um, I'm incorrect about that. But the, I guess the long and the short of it, even though we've been doing um, these things is we have not, um, they have not resulted in a decrease in the number of encampments or the number of persons living in encampments. And I think that um, I was actually on an, an outreach call today where um, they were saying that even as of yesterday, they were still seeing new folks coming into um, the Isla Vista area from other areas of the county. So a temporary emergency shelter is one of the viable options that can be funded as part of the community's coronavirus response. And so I won't bore you with a bunch of HUD language, but basically we have some tools in our tool belt um, that we don't normally have um, because we do have the, um, the option of uh, additional funding and additional approvals and expedited approvals for this type of um, shelter activity uh, during the coronavirus. 
So this is, um, again, just a rendering. It isn't an actual site map, but it's um, meant to give you a look at um, what's being proposed on the um, Isla Vista Community Center property and then the adjacent parking lot that's owned by the Isla Vista Recreation and Parks District. And I think, I'm not sure if, if you've reported out at all yet, but that um, Ivy Recreation and Parks District did uh, meet last night and had a similar presentation and um, that board uh, gave conceptual approval to moving forward with use of their, um, their parking lot. And then this morning, or this afternoon, we thought it was gonna be this morning, it wound up being this afternoon, um, the County Board of Supervisors also um, gave conceptual approval um, to moving forward with a temporary emergency shelter um, in Isla Vista. So the community center would actually be used by staff um, as so that they have a safe place to be, um, to to conduct some of their work activities, um, that they have an, a designated workspace. Um, it could be also that some clients are seen there, but it would also be used for staging and supplies. Um, one of the things we saw in the other two temporary emergency shelters is not having an indoor workspace um, and sort of room to assemble things and prepare um, really, really limited um, the house when uh, staff felt safe, right? Because they were kind of always in front of clients like at the Santa Maria High School. Um, and so this is uh, combining an indoor and an outdoor space is um, something that we really felt was necessary if we were going to try another uh, temporary emergency shelter. And so this fence is not probably what it will look like. Um, we are still deciding, but, but we know that a privacy fence so that sort of the folks that are living here are not on display um, for the community um, yeah, as people are driving by. So it really creates kind of a, um, a safer, more private atmosphere for them, as well as creates a safe um, perimeter to where only staff, um, people living in, in the pallet houses and um, the any service providers that are directly supporting them or you know the caterer dropping off things like that um, so that's what we are proposing is to have 20 um, pallet houses um, on the lot if possible we're still again trying to figure out exactly how the electrical is going to work etc so that may impact the number that are actually on the site um, but let me show you a little more of what the pallet houses actually look like. And we can always come back to this rendering if we need to. So I actually had the opportunity to actually visit a 30, a 30 pallet house village. They call it Riverside Cabin Village in the city of Riverside yesterday, operated by CityNet. And I can tell you that the actual pallet house looks exactly like this picture. In fact, I said, did you buy their linens from them too? Because they even had blue blankets. Um, but this is uh, really what it, it would look like, each individual pallet house. They're eight by eight um, reusable um, aluminum dwellings. They have electricity, they'll have a heater. You can't really see it very well, but there's actually a light um, here. Um, that kind of that lights up the um, the pallet shelter in the evenings. And so these wind up, they started a, they always bite you in, you know, get you in with a, a lower cost, but assembled, delivered uh, with the electrical panel, with the um, heaters and all that, it winds up being about $8,000 uh, per unit. And that's just the cost of the um, pallet shelter itself, not the infrastructure costs or the service operations costs of the shelter. So Good Samaritan uh, will, is the proposed operator. We did um, we didn't want to move forward with even um, you know proposing a shelter unless we knew we had a, an operator that could take on this task. And so we're we were thrilled that Good Samaritan responded to the letter of interest and statement of qualifications, and they really will be our lead in the area as far as coordinating housing navigation services across providers. Um, and then I, sh I share some of the, um, the different services that will be provided. Um, but I think something that's been important to others is that there will be 24 hour security and staffing. 
and that the county did a similar model on the service side where all of the departments were uh, serving out of one location when we had the Lompoc Riverbed um, intervention, which I think was in October of 2018. So this is just a, a snapshot of um, how many departments, and I don't think this is a complete list. We've been adding to it over the last couple of days, um, but these are the departments that we see having um, sort of a direct role um, in this project. And so um, it's, it's truly, um, it's going to take you all, it's going to take us and um, a lot of um, county departments as well as nonprofit providers uh, to make this successful. It is a time limited project, and I know that that is important um, to all of you as well. Um, we want to we want to respond with a sense of urgency, and so right now we will need a, a lot of approvals to happen to be open by uh, mid December, but that would still be our hope. Um, and then we would be open for a six month period ending in mid June of 2021. Um, we do hope again to, we have a working list of people who are already in encampments in Isla Vista. And so our goal would be to not have this be an expanding universe, but only those currently in the parks actually kind of a, of late last week would be um, potentially served by this project. And we really look to some of you that potentially are experts of who, um, who may be really needs um, additional assistance or would really benefit from this specific intervention that may be older, um, have more trouble through the winter, identifying people that may need to be prioritized for this intervention that were already in Isla Vista prior to um, COVID-19. And so we estimate the cost to be about $900,000. It's a big, it's a big number. And so we do, we've identified two sources of coronavirus relief funds, our local CARES funds, as well as um, emergency solutions grant CARES funds. We anticipate about 50 um, guests will be served over the six month duration with about 4,000 bed nights provided. And this is a Good Samaritan's projection. They did, they wanted to be very cautious um, that at least 15% of those persons would achieve a safer long-term housing placement, but that all shelter guests would be linked to vital services and other type of shelter opportunities. So this is kind of a quick summary of, oh, let's see, let me go back one. Um, a quick summary of kind of everything that I've shared. Um, but again, we're just um, very, uh, really interested in your feedback tonight. Obviously we're still um, at this conceptual phase and so um, would love to hear from, from your board and um, talk more about this ex exciting project. Thank you for that presentation, Kimberly. Um, I think that it's very thorough and presents a very good picture of uh, where the county is headed. Uh, I wanna ask our board members first, uh, if anyone has any uh, clarifying questions or questions about the presentation for Kimberly. I'll go to Director Freeman. Uh, so the first question that I have, uh, so this is a project that is due to its grant funding process uh, scheduled to um, last for six months. Is that my understanding? And that grant- That's correct. So I think there were two, um, two primary, um, Director Freeman, two primary, primary uh, reasons, right? We know that um, you all um, have plans for this building and that's critical to your operations, as well as the grant funding that we've identified um, is, a, is about a six month window at our projected cost. So we, um, we, are, we do very much wanna keep it to a time limited intervention. So a question that I have related to that is what happens at the end of the six months? Does there's just like a day where everything gets scrapped? Where do all the people go? Um, what is the expectation at the end of the time limited project? Yeah, so I think we really aren't going to approach it as, you know, let's wait till the end. <laughs> um, so first, before we even start in December, we'll be working really hard to, again, identify what other um, type of intervention is available um, for um, anyone that's currently um, in the parks and um, is open to services. And so 
Um, we this this isn't going to house everyone in the parks, as you can see from its size, and it's not meant to. Right, that there there are other housing opportunities. Um, both Path and the Rescue Mission do have um, beds available throughout the time period that we're talking about, and so we'll be looking at um, alternate shelters, transitional housing, and permanent housing opportunities from day one. So somebody might already now be, in fact, actually I know someone who's already in the park that's on their way to housing. And so they might, you know, we're gonna still be working diligently on that process, but maybe that housing probably won't be available until January. And so they might still go into the pallet house, um, but then move directly from there. So it definitely won't be a wait till six months and then everybody leave. Um, we'll definitely be working hard all the way through to actually really try and minimize the length of stay. Um, and then in those last 60 days, which is kind of the phase that we're in right now with our other temporary emergency shelter that, that I head up for the county called Project Room Key, is we stop taking anyone new in so that you can just work on um, moving those folks who are, are still residents um, to a safe exit. So it won't be like everyone moves in on December 20th and everyone moves out on June 2021. Does that help? That is very helpful. Thank you. Uh, I have another question, which is, uh, I'm actually kind of glad that we have, we have Joan here. Um, this is something that probably, to the extent to which there's any anything comes of the, my question here might be something that I end up having conversation with people outside of this. Um, but right now there is um, internet access being provided to the houseless community via equipment that I placed with permission from the community services district in the community center. And is it's kind of what is providing the ability to get that region where the houseless community has been kind of surrounding it. And so the question that I have is the extent to which we're going to be able to continue to do that with the community center. Is it possible that by the building services, general services or something would allow to continue having these loosely connected to the walls units to provide Internet service kind of a bridging across that building? The actual service comes from the community services district um, or occasionally my office across the street, depending on weather conditions and funny things like that. Well, I think that I did not know that was happening. So um, I learned something in every one of these meetings. So I think we would definitely, um, we are meeting almost daily now with general services as we prepare um, utility questions and how to get water and all those pieces. So um, Director Friedman, I'd be happy to, to work with them, letting them know that that's happening and, and how do we continue that? Because I absolutely, especially when we want it to be um, as productive a time as possible for the individuals in the pallet houses, having um, access to Wi-Fi um, so that they can stay connected potentially to family members, to service providers, and actually have something to do when they're in their pallet house um, is really important. So, um, so we, I think we would definitely want to preserve that if we possibly can, which I, I can't, I don't know why we wouldn't, but I'm definitely not going to speak for general services. So we'll get them connected with um, you and Jonathan soon. Thank you. Thank you for the questions, Director Freeman. Are there other questions from board members? All right, um, then in that case, I guess uh, we can open up for discussion. Any uh, points of discussion that we want to raise on the proposal? I see a hand from uh, Director Bertrand. Oh, I was just going to ask if we could go to public comment first. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think that's appropriate. Um, okay, so we'll open public comment. Any comments on this item? Feel free to raise your hand virtually or uh, just unmute and flag me. Or put something in the chat. Okay, seeing no public comment, uh, we'll bring it back to our board. Uh, I see Director Furlow. Go ahead, George. Yeah, my question is, is what action is being asked of us tonight? Or is this simply an information item? And I'm sorry if I missed it, but uh, the Board of Supervisors took action today, as I understand. What, 
what was their action today? The Board of Supervisors um, had uh, basically gave us a conceptual approval of the idea since we did not yet have the finalized agreement with Good Samaritan or the finalized agreement with IV Rex and Parks. So we wanted to, before we got moving much further um, to get the full plan uh, before the supervisors so that they could um, you know, give us uh, direct feedback. And so they did um, five, five O vote, um, provide conceptual approval to the plan that we just showed you. And Supervisor Hartman is on the call. So um, definitely uh, encourage her to weigh in if I'm not capturing that correctly. So does there, because, because of our standing vis-a-vis -vis the community center, does there need to be some kind of an agreement with the Isla Vista Community Services District or no? No. No. Okay. So we would have a, a license agreement with the Recreation and Parks District because we we're using their property. But my understanding is because the Isla Vista Community Center is, is currently county owned, we wouldn't need that that type of use agreement with um, with you all. Now, George, we won't be involved in the community center like on a lease basis after December first. So, county building one hundred percent by then. So, just one. I'm going to go to Director Birch. Sorry, go ahead. There's a, there's a lag. You can go ahead, George, and then we'll go to you. Oh, okay. So just to follow up. So what you just said, Jonathan, was that after December 1st, do I understand we will have a lease agreement? No, we, the, the month to month lease agreement that we're in now for the community center will end on December 1st. So is it my understanding then, because that's what I thought. I thought we had a lease agreement. Therefore, the fact that it's, you know, there that would, would at least require some kind of an understanding. Is it your understanding that as a result of this use, the negotiations for an ongoing lease would come to an end? Um, the lease we, uh, we were in for the community center that we approved last December actually ended June 30th. So we've been month to month um, on it since then. And after our board discussion and closed session, uh, we did uh, make the decision to end negotiations on the community center. That was the public decision. So that's when we uh, contacted the county and let them know that. I'm going to go, I think Ethan had his hand up and then after that to uh, Father John. Yes, thank you. Um, well, I just want to thank Kimberly, Lucille, Dinah, the whole team that's working on this. Um, we're really fortunate to have such caring leaders um, looking out for our vulnerable community members who are without homes. Um, over the past several months, all of us have been concerned about what we're seeing in the parks. Um, and the Scoyo Park is actually right by my house. And every day I see people um, struggling with mental illness, struggling with addiction, um, struggling with not having a roof over their head, struggling with health issues. And it's not been safe. Um, it's not been healthy. And these folks deserve better. They're our neighbors. And what I like the most about this potential project is that it has 24-7 services from a trusted provider like Good Sam. Um, having those professionals on the ground to provide direct services and also to connect people to housing um, in the long run, that's just going to be so important and it's going to make a great difference. Um, additionally, we want to be good partners to the Isle of Vista Recreation and Park District. Their board supported this last night. And I think this is very much in line with um, what they've been trying to do, which is determine um, a way that's fair, just, um, and compassionate um, to help get these folks into a better situation while also taking care of the parks. Um, what I'll also mention is that uh, on, in my job at the county, um, during the first part of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, I actually had the privilege of working with Kimberly, Lucille, and their team at the Project Room Key South site, um, where I got to see firsthand um, and participate in the work of um, helping folks in temporary housing and connecting them to longer term resources. And um, just being a part of that process, I could see how life-changing this work is. 
um, for everyone who um, gets to take part in these services. And um, it really is focused on stabilizing people, keeping people safe and healthy, and helping them keep a roof over their head after the pandemic. Um, and lastly, I'll just say that when I think about how our community responds to this situation, I really want us to be a model for what we want to see elsewhere in Santa Barbara County, which is that we want to have open arms for our neighbors experiencing homelessness. Um, and we want to help to really develop solutions that are going to reduce the impact of homelessness on our community. Um, so thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you, Director Bertrand. Director Hedges. Um, whether we are required to take action on this measure or not, I believe we should take action. Uh, whether we are uh, required to give uh, conceptual or other approval to it, I believe we should, uh, should certainly give um, um, uh, our, our, uh, our approval of the idea of this. Uh, it's the kind of innovation um, that uh, people have come to begin to expect from Isla Vista. And um, we should be in the middle of it, uh, whether we have the key to the building anymore or not, um, uh, at the community center, we should be all over this project in, in terms of, of supporting at whatever turn we can. Uh, I've looked at all angles of this. Um, I've spoken extensively with Sylvia and others in, the, in Kimberly and, uh, and others in, in the project. And um, uh, I, I am encouraged that this is a template uh, for, a, for a wonderful community-based response. And that's the kind of stuff we ought to be in the middle of. Uh, I'd like to see us at least declare our support for the project. Thank you for that, Father John. I also, uh, want to share my uh, thanks to everyone at the who has been working on this project, uh, the community services department staff, Kimberly, Lucille, Dinah, um, the folks at Good Samaritan um, who have proven themselves, I think, uh, very worthy of taking on this immense responsibility of running this shelter. You know, when COVID-19 first started, um, I think we all knew that it was going to impact our lives very profoundly, but I think some of the ways that we didn't quite um, uh, notice as much at the time are the things that have stuck in with us. And one of those things is that the closure of public facilities in Isla Vista and across our county, uh, places such as public libraries, uh, places such as the Pardall Center, has really, I think, forced us to confront the, uh, the scale of uh, the problem of uh, so many neighbors in our community being unhoused. And um, I th think that with this proposal, um, we are getting closer to finding a permanent solution for the folks who are experiencing homelessness in the parks right now. Uh, I heard Kimberly say at a board of supervisors meeting, uh, I don't actually have the number off the top of my head, I'm forgetting the number, I don't want to get it wrong, um, but it's a very large number of folks that have transitioned from the Room Key South temporary shelter that the county has right now into permanent supportive housing. And I think it's really important, uh, and I agree with Father John, that we should give our conceptual approval to this project. Um, the Isla Vista Community Center, as many folks know, has been a uh, project that has been a long time coming for our community. And I think that uh, many of us, uh, when this first was brought up, um, to be completely honest, uh, were dismayed with the location just because of how hard and how much energy and time has been spent um, to get to this point. Um, but I think what we've come to find is that uh, when it comes to um, a temporary shelter, there is never gonna be a perfect location. And uh, we as a government agency, whether we have a contract on the building or not, uh, as uh, an agency that has 
been very vocal about our plans to invest in the building uh, and in the site uh, should give our approval to this project um, as a, a blessing to um, just show that we are behind it. Um, and so I also want to thank Supervisor Hart Hartman's office uh, for the work that they have spent to get us to this place. And um, we've spoken about tiny homes on uh, many occasions and we're uh, not quite at a uh, quote unquote tiny home, but pallet home I think is a, a step in the right direction. Um, so I'm supportive of this project. I'll go to Director Thurlow. Uh, Father John, was that, was that a motion that you made? Because uh, I was ready to second it, but uh, will you make a motion for us that's, uh, that's uh, uh, sums up your feelings about this project? To the chair, is that, um, if I may, Yes, I, I, I would like to move uh, that the Isla Vista Community Service District uh, stand in solidarity um, uh, with the Pallet House project um, of the County of Santa Barbara um, and um, offer um, uh, whatever services we may be to the furtherance of that project. I'll second that. All right, um, that is a motion made by Edges and seconded by Thurlow. Um, with that, um, I think uh, I want to open up public comment. Any members of the public uh, have any comments that they'd like to share? Yeah, I have a comment. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead. Can you uh, state your name for the record? Yeah, my name is Peter Neuschel. I live in IV. I spoke at uh, the meeting yesterday where the entity actually had some ownership. You, I just learned, don't even own the, or even have a lease on a community center you're supposedly spending $29,650 on. As I said last night, a stone's throw from that parking lot is the San Rafael dorms at UCSB, UCSB, which because of COVID are entirely empty and will be so through June. Now listening to a district supervisor say that UCSB can't do this, I don't believe that. UCSB collects 160 million federal dollars on average every year. This is a million federal dollars that are supposedly gonna come from a grant if you even get it and how long it will take. And if this passes the Coastal Commission, nobody's actually talked about what if you don't get the money and this homeless situation continues. I think your board should make a motion to look into this UCSB business and see if you can get that university to open that dorm up so that these poor people can get out of the freezing cold and into a reasonable housing situation instead of a hut. So I don't understand why I seem to be the only person that sees this, but I lived in that dorm. I know very well where it is, and I can guarantee you it is empty right now. It's not being used. That's all I have to say right now. Thank you for your comments. Are there any other speakers that would like to comment? Uh, this is uh, Joan Hartman. May I speak? Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Joan. Oh, good. I, I had my hand up. I was a little slow at the draw for the first public comment, but the first thing I'd like to do is um, express my gratitude to Father John, who spoke eloquently and very persuasively at the board meeting today. Uh, I, it really had an impact on everyone. And um, at the meeting yesterday, I learned something that I didn't know, and that is that Sylvia Bernard of Good Sam is a UCSB alum and has uh, deep ties to the community. And I think that, uh, that everybody breathed a sigh of, oh, Oh, she understands, she gets it. She really um, has a feel for a very distinctive community. Uh, I, two points I really wanna make. The first is that um, this was a bottom up effort that involved many people on this board and, 
participating today and others in the community. And these ideas came from the community and we in the county did our best to explore every option that was raised. And this ultimately was the best that we could come up with quickly where we have control. And I think it's a really exciting option. Many people are looking at it as a pilot for going forward uh, in other places in the county. We're buying these pallet houses and we can use them in other applications later on. For, for your board, I think the community center is absolutely uh, key. And, uh, you know, I have to keep faith with Doreen Farr, who spent her entire uh, career at, at the board trying to nail down this community center and for the community use. And I am committed to following through with that. And as you heard, we've, we've got the money. It's use it or lose it money. So we, we have the money to spend on this and we wanna use it for good purpose. Uh, we don't have another option, but the community center will revert and right now you can't really use it for public gatherings anyway. So this is a good option. And I'm so excited to hear that Director Freeman has uh, Wi-Fi available for people. That's really extraordinary. So, um, so it, as you heard, it'll be phasing people in. Uh, I'm, many of you have heard housing first. Uh, you, you try to get people stable in a place so that you can reach them with all the services. If they're moving around and you're trying to locate them, it just doesn't work very well. So this gives us that opportunity. And it's one, I mean, you can hear the people from the county have a heart for this. And I think it's very, very much in accord with the people I've heard in the working group and on this board. So um, we're, we're going to need everybody's support to make this work. And so I'm, I'm very supportive of the motion that was made and seconded and I hope you'll vote for it. Thank you. Thank you for those comments, Joan. Are there any other members of the public that wish to speak on this item? Well, cool. I can speak really quick if there's no one left in the public. <clears throat> um, just a couple things. The first, which I do hate to be the bearer of bad news, but we technically didn't put this agenda item on for, for action in the agenda. So I, I don't think that the motion is within what we've agendized to the public we're gonna do here on this action on this item. Um, just because since we had no action to take, we didn't put one for action. Um, but I think I think the the message is loud and clear for everyone on here that our board uh, supports this. Um, just another thing I want to note that it was brought up by someone in the public, the iPhone. Uh, I think Mr. Nuschel uh, mentioned that we're spending 29000 on a building we don't have a lease for. I uh, just want to clarify for public information that this has been a big investment for the Community Services District for years. We've been working at the community room for two years, spending our budget and programming that space to provide services. Uh, we're cooperating in this effort. There aren't gatherings allowed, so we can't even use the community center. So while we budgeted money, we didn't spend the money because, you know, public agencies can make plans to spend money, but we aren't actually spending the money since uh, we never move forward with the lease. So we're going to pause our efforts to get this done. And I, it seems like back, you know, we'll get back on it in, in June of 2021. So we are not spending money on a building we don't have a lease for. That's an incorrect statement. Thank you for those comments, Jonathan. Um, uh, while I would have uh, liked to be able to take action to formally endorse it, um, I think that was a good summary um, that uh, it, it was good for us to have this item, to hear about this important project happening in our community so that we're informed as we move forward. Um, so thank you again, um, Kimberly, uh, Lucille, and everyone else on staff. Uh, we're looking forward uh, to seeing uh, how we can work together to continue to serve our homeless neighbors. If I can just end with, um, even though you weren't able to take formal action, I can tell you that um, you're, you are already leading the way, that you, you inspired us tonight again um, with your support and um, confidence in, in moving forward with this project. And I, I truly do believe that you will be uh, trendsetters and 
um, that that other communities that have said no to such ideas um, will it, it's just an exciting time so i just i'm so grateful and and know that i'm just inspired um, by your group thank you it's been great to thank work you for that I see a hand from Director Bertrand. You're on mute. Thank you. Um, can we direct staff to bring back a letter of support to place on our consent agenda for the next meeting? Are we agendized to take any action on this, Jonathan? Uh, we are not, but Ross says yes, that, that he texted me yes. So I'm gonna well, thank, thank yeah. you, Council. Um, Father John, do you maybe want that to be your motion? Father John, that I would be friend, that would be friendly. Yes. All right. Um, is it friendly with the second? Yes. All right. Jonathan, can you read it back to us? Yeah, motion to direct staff to bring back a letter of support of the Pallet Village project. Excellent. All right. Um, with that, uh, I think we've had a robust discussion. So I'm going to call the question. Jonathan, can you do roll call? Uh, Director Brandt. Director yes. Freeman. Yes. Director Hedges. Yes. Director Bertrand. Yes. Director Geis. Dr. Thurlow. Yes. Motion passes. I, I might have been mute, so advice was yes. All right. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us today, and uh, thank you for that important presentation. All right. Next, uh, we're going to move to item 4.2, which is the racial justice and public safety work group update. Uh, so this is our opportunity to review the calendar for what's coming back to the board and uh, propose new uh, options as well. Um, so do you board members have anything uh, new that they would like to add to the calendar? All right, hearing none then. Um, I think we can uh, close off and go into the, the first of our items uh, for sorry, I, came from the racial justice. Oh, sorry, Ethan, go ahead. No problem. Um, yeah, I just wanted to mention for community members that are joining us, uh, what we have coming up for next month is uh, 911 calls for service data to learn more about what the calls are um, as far as the trends for uh, when there are emergencies in the community, and then also an anonymous phone line or reporting stars for undocumented residents who want to report um, public safety issues. So thank you to staff for continuing to um, make progress on this list. I know we're going to have a number of um, previously agendized items uh, coming up next. So thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you for that, Director Bertrand. So the next item is the Santa Barbara Sheriff's Office and UC Police Department use of force policies item. This is for us to review and discuss uh, the policies of the two police departments. And I'll hand it over to Jonathan to uh, introduce this item. Yeah, um, you know, I, I introduced a bit last time, but what I'll cover again is that what we were able to secure were the UCPD and Santa Barbara Sheriff's Office use of force policies along with their, you know, the rest of their policy manuals. Uh, we, didn't, we don't have the full policy manual for UC Santa Barbara UCPD. We have a UC system-wide one, but we do have now, which we didn't have last time, uh, the use of force policy as of June, 2020. And then we have the most up-to-date uh, Santa Barbara Sheriff use of force policy as of June, 2020. As well. So now we do have all the relevant information. It's in the folder uh, on the agenda for people following along uh, to read through. So there's no staff report on these. It's just we're providing the information and you can see what the board's direction is to provide staff direction. Thank you, 
Great. Uh, thank you for that, Jonathan. Um, and uh, I want to also offer if we have anyone from UCPD or the Sheriff's Office that wants to uh, preface this or add anything to the discussion about the policies, uh, feel free. Now's your time. Uh, Deputy Schroeder is here from the Sheriff's Department. Nothing to add other than uh, our policy is transparent. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that, Deputy Schroeder. And I'm not sure if we have anyone from UCPD, uh, but if not, I think I can take it back to the board. Uh, Dave Miller is here from UCPD. I'm just I'm just listening. What what we have is uh, what our system wide uh, office of the president uh, policy, the UCOP. So we're at, uh, the rest of it, I believe, is being worked on. And as it comes available, I'll I'll send it through to Jonathan. Excellent. Thank you, Lieutenant Millard. Okay. Um, so I'll bring it back to the board. Um, any questions first on the policies uh, from our board? I see a hand from Director Bertrand and Director Freeman. Go ahead, Ethan and then Jay. Thank you. Um, well, thank you, uh, Deputy Schroeder and Lieutenant Millard for being here tonight with us. Um, in police use of force conversations, an important topic that we're hearing a lot about is de-escalation. And I know that it's something that um, both the Sheriff's Office and UCPD have worked on a lot over the past few years. Um, in fact, there was um, one example of an incident within the last year where there was um, a young man with a knife near um, Ocean Road. And I actually happened to be walking by right when that was happening. And to see the level of sophistication with the de-escalation techniques that ultimately led um, to no one getting hurt and the young man getting mental health care, um, that was really encouraging to see. At the same time, um, we do know that there are a lot of concerns about um, how force is used, how physical contact is made, um, especially when dealing with um, lower level um, offenses or emergencies that could be handled without law enforcement intervention. Um, but recognizing all of that, I'm just uh, curious if either of you want to elaborate on the changes that have occurred over the past several years with just um, a real commitment and focus on de-escalation. Um, de-escalation is, has, it's been around uh, for a while. It's, it's coming more to the forefront now. And what's happening is, is, is there is a, been a shift in training and there has been a shift in, in resources. And we see that across the board with many different uh, areas. Um, right now, UCPD, we're working with uh, a committee for uh, UCSB mental health services and looking at different ways to um, interact and respond to, to mental health calls. So that, that's a, an in process and system-wide within the UC system, um, we're definitely looking at um, you know, uh, more de-escalation de techniques and training for more de-escalation. Um, we have some stuff on our website, if you've looked at it uh, on de-escalation, uh, according to the California Peace Officer Standards and Training. And internally, uh, we're examining everything that we do and how we can better uh, serve the community that we're in. And uh, this is Deputy Schroeder. I'll just comment as well. I, I appreciate your comments, Ethan. Uh, as Of course, as you know, I was at that incident you mentioned, and um, I, I don't want to opine too much, but uh, I believe if that same incident occurred in the Midwest or other areas where deputies and officers aren't as trained, it could have had a different outcome. And so um, we really do pride ourselves on, on events like that where they're um, resolved without injury and too much force used. Um, going along with what Lieutenant Millard just said, the Sheriff's Department now is putting every deputy through the 40-hour CIT Academy. That's the crisis intervention training. Um, I was a member of the first group of deputies who went through that, so I'm on the original CIT team. And that's the, uh, the team that goes out with the mental health providers um, and, and responds to mental health calls. And so we're, we're now putting every deputy through that training. In addition to that, our quarterly training focuses on de-escalation. 
our December quarterly training is just de-escalation of situations, just as you mentioned. And so I haven't been through it yet, so I can't say what it is, but uh, I, I'm sure it'll be great training uh, for that. And so all, all departments, like Lieutenant Millard said, are now focused on de-escalation and uh, we're, we're, we're doing our best. They're not, they're not good situations to respond to. They're not, um, they're not easy. They're, people are in crisis. We need to help them and we're doing our best to do that. Thank you for the information. Thank you. Um, I think that there was a hand from director for you, so I'll go over to you. Sorry, I figured I would leave myself on mute while I coughed horribly. Um, so uh, I, I'm curious with this, uh, the, so the UC system has a use of force policy, which as we've seen specifically calls out to the UC local universities use of force policy. And so I guess I'm a little bit confused. Um, so you're saying that that, and I, I say you here, I mean, the, um, um, Millard, um, is that the use of force policy at UCSB isn't done yet. And so, but, but the UC system-wide one has ref referrals to uh, a local one. So I'm just, I'm curious, is it, is it, did I misunderstand? It's not really required and, and, and the, 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 the system-wide one really is comprehensive or uh, this actually came up in the last meeting that we had also. I don't remember, I think it might have been Father John actually called out a specific sentence even where it was like, this is just referring to something we don't have. Yeah, I think that you're, uh, you're definitely correct with that. It's, it's specifically not required for each of the university police departments. However, the, you, know, you know, we are 10 different campuses that have some unique stuff. But as far as the use of force policy, everyone is going to be uh, going with the UCOP policy, and then there'll be minor changes. We have things that we each of us do, but we, uh, I'm on that committee as well. We're collectively looking at everything that we do, and and we're going to come up with one use of force policy in the future for the entire system that we're all on because of mutual aid. We at points we travel to different campuses, so the the idea with that is is we're all falling under the same policy as we travel to the different campuses to to help out. Um, <laughs> we're looking at uh, systems within uh, the university to where we're all using the same forms and we're all doing things uh, in, in lockstep with each other for, for lack of better words. And for that, we've, you know, for our campus, I believe when I use, when I was in charge of our use of force uh, review board and decision making, I went to a seminar uh, from the police uh, police executive research forum and they're real big within policing that the whole uh, forum was about de-escalation and that was well, I think I did that in the end of two, 2017 and incorporated that into um, our use of force on campus which we've seen results in the the one that Ethan cited that was uh, excellent police work all the way around from both agencies uh, working together with each other and it ended uh, uh, in, in, in a great way uh, with what started out as a, as a, you know, volatile situation. So it was great work by the officers on scene and great teamwork by uh, both agencies. Thank you for that explanation. Um, so then I, I, I had uh, one set of comments, or my two related comments really about the um, Santa Barbara Sheriff's Department use of force policy. Uh, one thing that I think is somewhat um, interesting to note, uh, which is, um, and this is somewhat some people find this this aspect controversial. I actually I think this is probably okay, um, but it, it's interesting that um, so this is a relatively off the shelf policy that comes from a company called Lexapol, um, which provides uh, policies that are used by uh, sheriff's departments throughout and police departments uh, throughout California. Uh, I say this is a little, somewhat controversial because of course it's a, it's a private consulting company that then ends up drafting what ends up being policy and then they provide routine updates to various police departments throughout California and so it's you know the the, the private company that has you know um, uh, untold influence over how policing operates in the state um, uh, one piece of defense on that of course is is that uh, particularly for smaller police departments um, trying to come up with all of the complicated um, uh, legalese that might be required in order to make a policy actually work well and uh, be cohesive with itself is complicated. And as we've seen at the Alavista Community Service District, having a policy committee working on policies without even like draft policies that we can refer to can be very complicated. 
Um, it was notable to me, however, that this policy that we have is 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 so copied from it that there's actually um, little placeholders you're supposed to fix for like um, whether it's your department or office uh, and other uh, police agencies that I've seen actually did carefully go through and replace the, like you know our department or our, our office um, and we have our square brackets department slash office um, which that was kind of funny. Um, but to the extent to which it is um, uh, being followed, there, 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 there are advantages to doing something like this. Um, but uh, the Lexipol policies have come under scrutiny occasionally from uh, groups like Campaign Zero, um, and this is actually and, and the ACLU, and the uh, there have actually been lawsuits against some police departments with relation to their usage. I don't, th I don't think I'm. Mean, I also I'm not. You know, I'm not analyzing at the level of a lawyer or anything. I actually don't think our, our policies are running into some of the specific problems. I think Lexipol has, has fixed them. It's one of the cool things is that when the issues come up, Lexipol can try to fix them uh, and then try to push them out to uh, lots of other agencies. And, but, and yet, Campaign Zero continues to give the Santa Barbara Sheriff's Department a F grade um, on uh, their use of force uh, and uh, uh, really like policies and things like that. And uh, with a 43% grade, and they have a set of of policy criteria that they look for, and we don't satisfy them. Um, we satisfy two of the eight, uh, and uh, one of those actually is uh, requires de-escalation. Now, now, something to note about this is that oftentimes when specific uh, policy questions come up, there's a lot of there's a lot of pushback. Sometimes it sounds quite reasonable. Also, it's like, well, if I were to have a policy that says that I'm required to do this in some situation, um, then that might put me or my my um, uh, co-workers or the public in, in some form of danger and so i uh, wanting to limit the kind of policy that comes up um but that while tr while I, I appreciate that thought process i think it is worth pointing out that all of the policies that are being put forward by campaign zero are ones that are actually implemented in real world police departments uh, even here in, in california uh, and that um, it, it is something that at least some of the police departments have thought was a reasonable thing to do. Looking at de-escalation, I think is an interesting one. There's there's careful wording that is actually virtually identical um, of all of the. They're, they're like when you get to the really subtle points, um, some you actually see like UC's um, use of force policy actually comes kind of close in alignment, um, potentially within within like sub sentences with the Santa Barbara County Sheriff one. With case of um, de-escalation, it is that. Um, uh, that the officer, uh, quote, should consider de-escalation, um, which of course, when you're working with like legal wording is effectively doesn't have to do anything. Um, it's not even that you must consider it and then reject it. It is that you merely um, are, are essentially being recommended to consider it uh, in, in certain circumstances. Um, I, I personally think that it might be nice to actually, you know, go forward, go push that forward um, further as, as other police departments have. Um, another example of this um, is that, so, uh, this is actually related to the lawsuits that come up is uh, relating to shooting at moving vehicles, which is, of course, kind of um, a complicated subject here in Alavista. Vista, but no one's, no one's ever questioned the idea that if the vehicle is being used as a weapon or the vehicle has somebody in it who is actually shooting at other people, um, uh, shooting at vehicles and those sorts of things, maybe somebody's questioned, but not even Campaign Zero is questioning that. But um, there is this subtle point about what if a police officer is in front of the vehicle and the vehicle is now driving towards the police officer. Is the situation where a police officer has put their, their themselves in peril by choosing to walk in front of a car, and then now the car uh, um, is, is driving at them, is that a situation where which is considered um, okay to shoot at the car? Uh, and um, one of one of the, the policies that you see people trying to put forward is the idea that that should not be the case. And so, in fact, the, the Philadelphia Police Department actually has a specific um, uh, clause on that. Moving into or remaining in the path of a moving vehicle, whether deliberate or inadvertent, shall not be justification for discharging a firearm at the vehicle or any of its occupants. By the way, the reason why this is considered so um, interesting of a point for policy wonks on this is that shooting at a moving vehicle is very seldomly helps but puts uh, bystanders in serious danger. And so unless it is the case, which of course, near dear to our, our situation here in Alavista, Vista, that there's somebody in a car using it as a weapon, or this happens separately, we, we run into this situation multiple, multiple times here, um, actually shooting at people from the car, you don't want to be shooting at a vehicle. Um, but yeah, and so they continued, an officer in the path of an approaching vehicle shall attempt to move to a position of safety rather than discharging a firearm at the vehicle or any of its occupants of the vehicle. And, and a little little clause additions like this, I think, can be valuable. Um, so I bring all this up, and I guess my, my main question is just the extent to which the Sheriff's Department has any response to the idea that we have received such a poor grade from Campaign Zero. 
um, which was actually campaign zero, although it was, it was, it was, it was, he used the wrong word, and I don't remember what word he used, um, but so it made me wonder if it was, maybe he was talking about something different, but Sheriff Bill Brown actually brought up this project at um, the uh, city of Goleta when he was speaking on, on, on use of force a month or so ago. Um, but yet, Campaign Zero has given the Sheriff's Department a, a, a failing grade, and I'm curious, is there any response to that? Past that, because the CSD doesn't really have any power or jurisdiction over any of this, um, is mostly just my curiosity and commentary on these policies. But, yeah. Well, I guess that uh, that put me, Deputy Schroeder, here on the spot. Uh, I, I don't know the eight grading points that uh, the campaign had, and so if if I could review those and and comment on them i would be happy to but I, I don't have them in front of me uh so i'll just respond to the two points i guess you made the first point um uh, being that we shall attempt de-escalation in every situation um i've i've been employed with the department for 15 years i've been um brutally attacked here in isla vista on duty put in the hospital undergone surgery um we do not have a shall de-escalate policy but i tried um, and looking back, I should not have tried because that put me in grave danger to the point where I was severely injured. Um, and, and part of my body will never recover from that. And I won't go into detail, but, um, so having said that, I, I just worry about saying shall deescalate in every situation because some situations do not allow time or, or that's not a reasonable conclusion. And so, um, I, I think that is something we should look into, but just I wanted to put that in context that uh, sometimes a, a relatively minor contact can escalate very quickly. And if there is a shall, and in the back of your mind, that takes two seconds to try and do those two seconds could mean uh, severe injury, life or death. Uh, on your second point, uh, I, I also think that's reasonable. We are trained that way. Um, we are certainly not trained to stand in front of a vehicle just running at us and shoot at it. Um, our, our first line of defense is to jump out of the way. And so uh, similarly, I think our policy is just written to allow uh, the firing of a handgun in a situation where you would need to do that, like what happened in Isla Vista uh, six years ago. However, um, any practical training does not train us to stand in front of or, or jump in front of a car and then shoot at it. So, um, but, 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 but to your original question, um, if I could see those eight points, I'd be happy to review and comment on them. Thank you um, for your comments on that. Um, I, I, I do appreciate the premise that a lot of the, I mean, uh, having policies at all um, can be essentially put police officers in a position or in sheriff's and deputies, uh, more technical, in a position where there is more risk to them. And that risk as risk sometimes goes badly. Um, I, I guess the, the thought process that I oftentimes think is, is that the, the lack of those things puts risk on members of the public who had less choice in, in potentially joining that, you know, like opting into that risk. And so it, it is a, it, it's a trade-off on risks. And, and, I, and I sometimes am concerned that it's always in the discussions balanced on, on this extent of maintaining safety for the, whether it be when you call it a public employee or whether you want to actually specifically state the, the officer. Uh, but I, I, I do appreciate that point. And I, I thank you for, for bringing it up and responding. And it actually does remind me that, um, so one, one of these other eight points um, uh, was about having a use of force uh, continuum. And the only reason I pointed this one is I actually was excited to see that the UC Santa Barbara, um, uh, not Santa Barbara, the UC system-wide uh, use of force policy actually had some aspects of this. Um, it was it was interesting, for example, to note that chemical agents um, uh, for crowd control and things like that were, were not listed as just non-lethal. They were listed as uh, an intermediate um, uh, use of force. And then there were like different ideas on when intermediate uses of force and, and when they could be utilized and how and by who and um, and the, by, ha by, by listing out the, the, the full continuum of what the office, like what the office or debt or department considers to be the um what is more forceful than other things it gives an opportunity to be able to feel like oh well, you know they just feel like a, you know taser is equivalent to this and it's like oh no no it's like well maybe in, in situations where this comes up this would be pre preferable to that um but yeah i was I, I appreciated seeing some of that commentary particularly since one of the um uh, thoughts that um i i've, I've had uh, is that uh, the, the indiscriminate in some cases uh usage of, of chemical agents for crowd control I mean, is something that I will point out is actually um, 
uh, barred from uh, international warfare, um, but the United States was adamant that we get to continue to use it for domestic policing purposes. Uh, and, and since it actually did happen and was used in Isla Vista, and there were some bad stories related to it that sounded a lot like some of the stories that had come up earlier this year um, uh, in, in other cities, uh, it just it was something that I kind of stuck out to me. But I'm not have anything to really put anyone on the spot on that one. This is another thought process to think about. Thank you so much for tolerating all my comments on this. And again, it's just like, I don't really, we don't really have any control over this. So it's just an opportunity to have an opportunity to like look through review and take some questions. So thank you. Thank you, Director Freeman. Uh, you know, I see a lot of value in this discussion. Uh, as you mentioned, even if we are not the agency that has uh, the strengths to be able to change policies uh, or require different types of training um, because that's not our jurisdiction, I think there's a lot of value in having members of the public have the opportunity to understand what it is that the policies say. And also the nuances, I think that um, Deputy Schroeder, I think, was alluding to, which is that it's one thing for us to have a policy that describes uh, how things go under the best circumstances in the ideal world, uh, but there's another in terms of how that gets implemented. And a lot of that comes down to the training and to uh, judgments uh, that are made on behalf of maybe one person in a really uh, high stress and high risk situation. Um, you know, looking through both of the use of force policies, I think two big things that I happy to see in there uh, was, you know, the requirement of uh, there to be a, a imminent threat uh, for force to be used and for that continuing to be done, and um, requiring um, a, a duty to intervene if there are uh, officers that believe that a fellow officer is is going to far uh, or is not uh, acting appropriately given a situation. Um, and I think those are two important things uh, for the public to understand as we think about this and um, how a force is used by our law enforcement agencies. Um, but I think it's also really important, which is something that Deputy Schroeder mentioned, um, which is that a lot of this comes down to de-escalation and the type of training that officers are receiving um, I'm really pleased to hear that um, this is a, a sounds like a full uh, topic of a full month's training uh, that's happening at the sheriff's department. Um, and uh, I think it's an important conversation. Um, I'm glad that it's being had, and especially, um, you know, when it comes to uh, some of the things that we've discussed in the past about, you know, what is the appropriate way for us to respond to some of these calls for service that are high stress that may involve someone who has a mental or physical ailment? Um, and are there ways that we can respond that more appropriately fit that situation? So um, uh, while uh, I think that um, the policy touch, those policies, um, uh, like I said, we don't have direct jurisdiction over them. It's still good for the public to know. Uh, are there any other uh, comments or questions from members of our board? Director Bertrand? Thank you. I do have one comment and question. Um, so over the past, uh, I guess, four or five years, I've oftentimes referred to um, President Obama's Task Force on 21st Century Policing Report, um, a landmark report from the Department of Justice on how communities can improve uh, relations between law enforcement and community members. Um, a lot of this came about after um, the Ferguson events, and um, it had a lot of promising recommendations. I think some of these recommendations have been implemented over the past several years, um, and some I hope to see implemented with the new administration in DC. Um, but one of the recommendations in the report is that uh, 1.6 uh, law enforcement agencies should consider the potential damage to public trust when implementing crime fighting strategies. And um, I've looked at this a number of times, and what this recommendation really talks about is looking at the risk versus reward. So obviously there are 
different things, different issues that law enforcement responds to um, where it's a high priority and a high public safety risk and law enforcement needs to respond to it. Um, there are other things that are more minor and in, this, uh, in these discussions in the past, we've discussed broken windows policing where um, a lot of emphasis is placed on minor offenses. And when thinking about those minor offenses, um, say someone who is uh, either has an open container or a minor in possession of alcohol, um, or and a, a type of issue that I've witnessed on campus, someone skateboarding by the library. Um, those are both two examples of offenses where uh, I've seen force used. And those are seemingly minor offenses that um, perhaps an officer could have just backed away and said like, hey, yes, we do enforce this, but um, maybe it's not worth engaging with this person because we don't want it to escalate for something that's just so minor. Um, so I'm curious if there are any policies or if there are any practices related to weighing the risk versus reward for lack of a better term when dealing with minor offenses that could escalate or um, officers could just walk away. I don't know if you want me to go first, Lieutenant, otherwise I can. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, thank you, uh, Deputy Bertrand, or uh, Director Bertrand for your question and comments. Um, yes, absolutely. Uh, if you were present, I'm sure the, the UCPD had the similar briefing as we did. Um, risk versus reward is written throughout our policies and it's preached during the briefings. Um, I, I happen to be in every one of the briefings and so I heard it over and over and over. It, is the juice worth the squeeze was the comment this year and you can uh, pick any version of that you want. Um, what, what that means is, is the crime worth pursuing? And so like you just said, is an open container worth um, chasing a person, uh, getting into a use of force, potentially injuring yourself, potentially injuring others? And so uh, absolutely, we consider that on every single case and every single um, call we go to, every single traffic stop, every single pedestrian contact, that is, it's heavily weighed. And and these days, especially on calls with mental health issues, um, is us kicking in a front door and barging in to create a use of force situation worth it? Or should we just walk away and let them deal with that on their own and have a mental health provider come the next day and follow up? And so um, we do that on a, on a daily, on an hourly basis. And, and so I hope that's not misconstrued, that we just absolutely are these robots that enforce the law without even thinking about it. And so I appreciate you bringing that up because that's, that's not the case at all. Um, and then going back to your first comment, Obama's um, policy there on, on 21st century policing, uh, I don't want to go into our promotional process, but I know I was a part of it. And, and testing for our sergeants, that was the topic four years ago. And so... Um, <laughs> to, to, to think or, or, or say that police departments are not implementing that or taking it into consideration is just, is just wrong because we, we are reading it, we are abiding by it, and, and we are implementing it. So uh, I, I hope that covered what I was supposed to say. Yeah, and I, I appreciate that. And to be clear, for the last four years, we've had a United States Department of Justice that has just completely put the report aside. So I'm glad that we do have law enforcement agencies in California that still believe in the report. Um, but the same department that issued the report um, has not been implementing it and has backtracked on a lot of things. So that was my point there. Um, but it was very helpful to hear um, your perspective on how uh, that type of decision making is an everyday part of the work of our officers. Well, this is Dave uh, from UCPD. I, I would agree with, with what Deputy Schroeder said. And some of that stuff there would be, uh, that he's talking about, would be considered officer-initiated activity. And I think one thing we can't forget is we are public servants. So, you know, and I'll talk about campus in particular, um, bicycling and skateboarding on campus can become hazardous. And we receive multiple calls during when school is in session. And with that, as a public servant, when we receive a call for service, there's a, there's a duty to respond and an expectation that we respond. Now we, we have handled things 
differently on many occasions, so much so right before COVID hit, um, a method that I uh, thought of and was successful in is, is partnering with our local pizza establishments um, to hand out free coupons for pizza for people uh, walking their bike or riding their skateboard correctly, just so we could go on the other side of it and not issue citations and and tell them thanks. Hey, thanks for helping us out and thanks for you know being a, a good member of the community. Um, unfortunately, COVID hit, so those are you know a few hundred of those are still sitting on my desk. But we are looking at ways, and we're constantly looking at ways. But um, you know there is an expectation with the sheriff's department and UCPD that. Uh, when something like that is happening and a, and a member of the community is unhappy with it and calls that we we respond uh, and uh, you know there is the expectation from the member of the community that, that action is taken we don't necessarily have to take an enforcement action it could be an educational action but that that does become a balance and a challenge uh, when that happens thank you Are there any other uh, comments from members of the board? All right, um, I'll open it up for public comment. Any comments from members of the board? All right, not seeing any, uh, I'll bring it back to our board. Um, any uh, closing comments about uh, the use of force policy? This was a really important thing for us to discuss. Um, understanding of the policy to also get a better understanding of uh, the different things that go into the decision-making process to use force. Um, so uh, I think um, Lieutenant Millard and uh, Deputy Schroeder for being here today to do some of the explanation work on that end. Um, and I'm sure we'll continue to have the discussion about how we can better make public safety uh, uh, more equitable and community oriented in our All right, I'm gonna go back on our agenda. Um, the next item is uh, on community input for public safety and police and hand this over to Jonathan. Great, thank you. Um, so this has been a couple, you know, maybe a month and a half since we last had the board look at this project, but we're ready to launch the survey, but I just wanted to bring it back one last time to, you know, first, you know, this is now, you know, the public can access the survey here. They know that it's on our agenda as a place to take it, but also to ask the board if this captures um, everything that you'd be wanting to learn and look at over the next year. We can always add and change the questions, but we'd like to at least use this through June, so. Wondering if this, and most of the questions, if not all, are from former surveys of public safety and our budget that we've done in the past. So there are not a lot of new ones. There's a couple, but we've used a lot of these before, which is, you know, I think helpful since we've asked them. We can track the responses over time. But just, yeah, please let me know if there's anything else the board wants to learn through this process. and for putting this together. Um, my first question, I just want to get in here. Um, are we planning on having this translated into Spanish as well for distribution? Yes, that is actually part of the plan. Excellent. And we'll probably do like a paper version available too. Great. And can you elaborate too, just in general, uh, 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 what the distribution process for it will be? Yeah, it's going to be mainly online um, through different listservs and social media. It's a little bit of social media ads, um, but mainly through working with organizations we have relationships with to ask them to promote it, which has been the most effective. Great, great. Thank you for that. 
Um, any other uh, questions or comments from board members? Director Bertrand. Thank you, uh, Jonathan, Deborah. great job putting this together. This looks great. Um, the one main um, thing that I'm thinking about is I think this is good for an overall safety survey, um, but when we did initially discuss this, um, kind of how I envisioned it was almost like a um, in input box where someone can leave suggestions, a suggestion box. And I think this is good for getting a high level of information about how people feel about public safety and their interactions with uh, public safety services. Um, but moving forward on top of this, if we can have a function where perhaps um, people can write in and say what they want to say um, as much or as little as they want to say about um, their interactions with public safety services, I think that's a good um, component too. Um, and that way, even if someone doesn't have something to say now, uh, they know that, oh, I saw something that I really liked and there's a way that I can provide feedback on that. I'm going to provide feedback or, oh, I had a really bad situation. What do I do about it? Oh, I can go provide feedback through this system. Um, I, I think that that will be a very good function to have um, so that people can provide input more incidentally as good, bad, or indifferent things come up. Uh, but for getting a high level gauge on how people feel about um, safety services and if people feel safe in Isla Vista and how people feel about racial justice issues, I think this is really good. Cool, yeah, I mean, what we can do is we can just add a, another question to the beginning of this, which is just, do you have anything you wanna add on public safety? And then just none of the answers are required. So someone could just answer one. Um, and the way we set it up on our website, it can just make it obvious that you can just submit anything you want or you can fill out the survey. Got it. Thank you, Director Bertrand. Any other questions or comments from board members? All right, only the last thing I would add that is, is this a survey, can you take it anonymously if you choose to? I think you're on mute, Jonathan. Yeah, like I just said, none of the answers are required and it's not, doesn't verify anything. So anyone can submit anything on here. I mean, that, that's, it, it does open us up though. People could submit things that aren't true, but I don't think that's gonna really happen uh, at a high level or if people have time to just fill out surveys, uh, incorrectly. So it's, it's open to just having it be filled out by anybody at any time without, you know, you can only fill in just the, you could only answer one question. You can just drop in like, um, Ethan mentioned like your experience. Uh, you could provide your name and email if you want, but, um, they're not required. Thank you for that. Um, I don't know if we're being, are you, are we being asked to give formal, formal approval? I think this is just um, for our review, um, but um, I do want to open it up for public comment. Uh, anyone have public comments on the community input for public safety and food safety? All right bring it back to the board then. Um, so like I said, I don't think we're taking formal action on this, but it was good for us to get to review it. Any uh, party comments from uh, board members? All right, thank you again, Jonathan and Deborah for your work on this. Next on the agenda, we have uh, the district COVID-19 response. Great. Um, there is, you know, the first thing I'd say is we had a successful Halloween uh, in Isla Vista, and I think our efforts were a big part in helping achieve that. I can give you that the, you know, we, we distributed our door hangers twice to most parts of Isla Vista, and at the high, at the, at the busiest time on Twitch, we had around 650 to 800 households uh, who were watching our music festival live stream. 
during the evening. So we had a great success in getting the message out to residents on where they can find access to testing in Isla Vista and how they can stay safe, especially during Halloween, but at all times. So we we had so we're now going off of that success. The next thing we did is we um, asked our COVID response group uh, what the plans are in November with messaging to residents in terms of holiday travel and how to handle that. I don't know if there's we haven't I haven't gotten a direct um, communication on what the official guidance is going to be. I know UCSB is working theirs out too. What we heard so. That, that's the next step is helping get that message out is holiday travel plans and how to do that the correct and safe way. But uh, besides that, that there's no other COVID response uh, news besides what we're already doing. Great, thank you for that, Jonathan. And I just wanna say, uh, please send our thanks and gratitude to the folks at Lucidity Festival uh, for putting on such a successful event. Um, you know, from the beginning, I think we all knew it was a pretty unconventional thing for us to uh, try to utilize the district facilities to do a virtual event uh, for Halloween. Um, but I'm really pleased with the way that it ended up turning out. Um, and I think it happened a really positive impact on the community. Um, I know just from being uh, out uh, walking around and uh, checking things out on uh, that weekend, uh, it did look virtually non-existent as it has in years past. Uh, so I think we're continuing uh, the positive trend, um, but, but especially now given COVID-19, uh, it is especially important that we did continue that. Um, and I think that we have a really solid foundation for expanding our partnership with a group like the Lucidity Festival in the future um, to try and use programming as a way of diverting uh, folks away from engaging in some of the riskier uh, and uh, potentially less safe activities uh, that have gone on during large uh, attendance weekends in Isla Vista. Um, so I'm really excited about that. Um, and I know we have a number of community members that actually have to make it in the program themselves and get on the live stream. Um, so I think that's really cool. Um, I think Jonathan and me both had like, like a thing where we just were talking to our uh, phone, uh, which isn't quite as cool, but I saw some uh, people got to actually be on the set, um, which I thought was really special. So please just uh, say a big thank you to them from us. And uh, thank you for all the work that you and Deborah put into it to hold this together really at the last minute, only less than 30 days from uh, the date of execution uh, to the date uh, where we have the contract signed. So thanks again for all your hard work. Yeah, thank you. It was a great, <clears throat> great accomplishment for IBCSD. Any other uh, comments from board members or questions on COVID response? I mean, at the risk of uh, being repetitive, I just want to give kudos to staff and Lucidity and community partners. Fantastic event, big success. Thank you all so much. Thank you. And the community stayed home too. They, they deserve credit for not doing the things people were afraid of them doing. Any other comments from board members? Director Thurlow? Yeah, uh, good work, good work staff on this one. Uh, Jonathan, can you give us any kind of an overview of, uh, you know, I, I read something that said that um, COVID cases in Isla Vista were down um, significantly over the last week or so. Can, can you kind of give us a bigger picture of what's going on in terms of cases, testing, and, uh, you know, what the what the county is doing yeah i mean there's still testing happening pretty much um every end of the week so there's going to be testing uh, from the 11th 12th 13th and 14th i think one of those might, might have been canceled but you know those four days this week there's testing um the cases right now there's 22 active cases in isla vista and that's that's lower than 
when we had our last board meeting, but it's, I think last time I could check right now, but it was maybe 35 or somewhere in that range. So it is lower, um, but Isle of Us is still having regular cases uh, that are you know, comparable to other communities in the county that are bigger than us. Uh, so there's still, there's still active cases here, but it has definitely, you know, I don't wanna say gotten better, but it, there's less right now. I can hear, I'll check what our last board meeting, it's coming up right now. Um, we had 36, yeah, 36 active uh, cases at our last boarding and 22 now. So we went down by 14 in two weeks. And I see a hand from Director Bertrand. Thank you. Yeah, I agree with what Jonathan said. Um, but we still do have a, a great task ahead and a lot to be proud of with that reduction. But just looking at the chart now, like as Jonathan said, we're at 22. Um, the city of Goleta currently has 13 active cases. Um, the city of Santa Barbara, which is considerably bigger than Isla Vista, has 29 active cases. And the city of Santa Maria, which is way bigger than Isla Vista, has 39. Um, which obviously is higher than the 22, but when you think about scale, um, 22 is a lot of cases compared to those other cities. Yeah. Director Freeman. Yeah, there was an article in the uh, Santa Barbara Independent week, two weeks ago about um, the road to uh, reopening goes through Isla Vista. So we are getting a lot of a lot of kind of flack pointed at us for the, um, as Ethan was just describing, elevated numbers. One thing, though, that I found, I don't know, it's really interesting about it is like the very first sentence begins and it talked about the total number of cases, not looking at specifically active cases. And the total number of cases um, uh, was a number, it was like 300 some, then it said this 4% of cases is what is preventing the county from reopening. And of course, when you look though at the number of people that live in Isla Vista, it, we are about 4% of the population of the county. So from the perspective of total cases, we actually are, you know, statistically, we seem fine. So then the question I, I'm, this kind of comes to mind is, is that what might be a discrepancy between momentary active cases and um, total cases. And uh, one one issue, right, is is that we're dealing with small numbers. I mean, when you're dealing with like 13, um, it, it, it's difficult to even you know talk about statistics. But we also have a lot of large, dense housing, and so if one person gets it, you would kind of expect to get an immediate clip of like, oh, well, now 12 people got it because you can't have one person in Isla Vista get it. They're I mean, you quarantine them away from the four people who live probably within the same room as they are. It'd be very difficult, right? Um, and so. Uh, I actually wonder how bad we're even doing, because if you think about like the integral over time is going to be the total and the total is seemingly fine. So um, it's not to say that we shouldn't keep doing what we're doing, um, but I, I, I'm a little bit sad about the bad press that Isla Vista keeps getting about this when it's not clear to me that we are, in fact, the problem. Thank you uh, for that, Director Freeman. Um, and I'll just say, uh, I think uh, many of us on the board have probably grown accustomed to uh, some of the pervasive negative attitudes about Isla Vista that exist and the uh, quick quickness that some have uh, to point the finger at uh, college-age students who um, are uh, just trying to live their lives. Um, but I don't want that to take away from uh, what I think both you and Director Bertrand said, which is that we do need to continue doing what we're doing um, and really redoubling our efforts, you know, as uh, different things converge, such as uh, the flu season uh, happening, you know, starting basically right now. Um, so I, I just want to use this as an opportunity to remind residents, uh, if they haven't yet, um, go get your flu shot. Um, I believe that it is uh, free or with a incredibly small copay for most insurance providers and uh, get tested for COVID-19. It's an important thing we can all do, whether we have symptoms or not, to try and keep our community healthy. Um, I believe there are still spots available for the testing that's going on in Isla Vista this weekend. Um, 
I actually just pulled up the county website and it, it's allowing me to start registering. Um, so I think that that indicates there are spaces available and um, that will be happening this uh, uh, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday uh, from I believe 10 a.m. to 4 p.m. at the Isla Vista Theater. Um, so um, uh, definitely remember to, uh, to do that and for us all to do our part uh, to make sure that we continue to see an improvement. Any other uh, comments from the board? All right, um, any comments from members of the public about COVID response? All right, um, then with that, um, if we have nothing else on this update, I think we'll close this item. And uh, the last item we have under action is the left coat and municipal service review update. So I'll hand this over to Jonathan and I also see we might have someone uh, joining us from uh, LAFCO tonight as well. Yes, we, we have, looks like we have LAFCO Commissioner Craig Geyer and our, our own Jay Freeman. Um, so this memorandum is one that you've seen before. Um, Ross uh, updated it this week or at the end of last week after LAFCO took its uh, formal action on our municipal services review. So it's updated with the new information that our municipal services review will take place in 2022. And the dates would be that we turn in our MSR in March and the, the hearing happens uh, sometime before June, before the end of June. So that's uh, 14 months from now is when our MSR is due approximately, or 14 months from now is when, you know, everything we've done uh, that counts for the time we write the MSR starting in 2022. Um, so it's not a lot of time that we have left, but like uh, both myself and Spencer have said, uh, when asked that we're confident we can get, we can meet all the requirements uh, in a robust and effective way. So. Um, I think one of the other, you know, points that we've talked about at the last meeting is uh, having another board retreat soon. And I think that this, this memo and the next steps that need to take place uh, as part of planning towards the municipal services review would be uh, the main focus of our board retreat, uh, one of the main focuses uh, so that we can start planning uh, how we spend our time and resources uh, in 2021 and 2022. So that's all I have since, you know, we've, we've already had an extensive discussion on this, but now we have the final word on when this is happening and the final vote. Um, and I want to just see if Ross has anything else he wants to add to this discussion. Yeah, thanks, Jonathan. I think the only thing I want to add, uh, since we did go through everything in a, a lot of detail in September, uh, just to invite the, uh, the board's attention and invite members of the public who may be looking through this uh, to a couple of highlighted areas uh, to emphasize the fact that there are certain actions uh, that require either cooperation or an official act by the county in order for the district to act. For example, uh, on uh, financing the operations of the municipal advisory committee, the district has to work with the County Board of Supervisors in preparing and drafting the resolution for consideration in order to establish a MAC. The district cannot act unilaterally on its own to create a MAC. Uh, that's similar to uh, uh, financing operations of an area planning commission. The Board of Supervisors is the one that actually authorizes the creation. Uh, so the district cannot act on its own. Uh, the parking district we've already gone through in a lot of detail. Uh, but I'll close with the zoning uh, code and building code enforcement is going to be tied to the creation of a local planning commission. Uh, and so I just highlighted those for to emphasize the areas of cooperation with the county uh, where it will be needed for activation or actually to put those powers into use. Uh, and I think also we've uh, I've highlighted a couple areas uh, where the uh, financial aspects. Um, are going to be a consideration. It's going to cost more money 
uh, to activate and to operate certain powers or services uh, than maybe the board has considered in the past, just to help the board consider its pi uh, policy priorities and how it goes about um, making sure that all of the different powers as enumerated in 61250 uh, are being um, activated and used to the satisfaction of LAFCO. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you for those comments, uh, Jonathan and Ross. Um, I think um, uh, Jonathan summarized or, uh, my feelings where I think when we went to LAFCO, um, while we had hoped to get an extra year, I am still confident that we will be able to satisfy all the conditions of a municipal service review under this timeline. And really it just reiterates for us as a board, um, sort of uh, a uh, continued uh, level, I think, of urgency to see through uh, these things that we've been working on. You know, uh, this last Friday, we were awarded the state transportation uh, or sustainable transportation equity and planning grant uh, in order to uh, put in place a plan uh, for uh, transportation in Isla Vista in partnership with uh, agencies such as MTD. And I think that going forward, um, that is a really important aspect uh, of our powers that I think the community is really hungry to see is how we can make an impact on the planning process, on the transportation uh, utilization in our, in our community. And so uh, I'll be really excited for us to continue those discussions in tangible ways. Um, I think I saw a hand from Director Freeman, so I'll go over to you. I just wanted to say that, um, so of the couple compromises that were being presented at the meeting, uh, this one being one uh, that kind of, kind of came somewhat as a surprise from, from DOS, actually the play-by-play the -play in some sense was that partway through the meeting, uh, Joan said that she had to uh, do another uh, another meeting and left, which actually caused DOS to get promoted to a voting member. He was able to make a motion with this compromise of it being instead of something happening quickly or something happening uh, two and a half years from now, having something happening one, one and a half years from now. Of the compromises available, I actually ended up liking this one the best. And a key aspect of that for me is that the the, our district seems to be right now under some fire related to things that we don't really have much control over, um, whether it be the outcomes of, of the COVID-19 pandemic and, and things related to all of the uh, encampments that are happening on property that we don't own or lease or really have any anything, any say over. Um, and that uh, the con concern that I have is, is um, to the extent to which any kind of, any aspect of municipal advisory Sorry, municipal, any aspect of a municipal review would end up occurring about our district uh, in the relatively near future, that that would be an opportunity um, for such um, uh, opinions to get stated into there. So I'm very happy of the idea that we've pushed this at least far enough in order to get it passed when hopefully with between new administration, fixed government, vaccines, um, past the six month horizon on the encampment, well past it, such to the point where maybe if even something happens after it, something can clear up that we're in a better position with relation to the immediate opinions that have just cropped up in the last few months. I mean, if this had happened even a year ago, I think it would have been better than happening right now. Um, but uh, yeah, so I, of the compromises that were put forward, I liked it. Of course, I would have preferred if we could get what we wanted. Um, I do have a question for, or a couple questions for Ross. Um, so Municipal Advisory Council is an example. Um, can we, you know, a lot of a lot of things that governments try to do, they do rate studies. Uh, is, is it possible that we could do some kind of, some, we could just spend some money towards the thought process of how to organize it? I mean, at one point I was even assigned, I didn't do it, so it was my fault. Um, I was even assigned to like go to the, I love this community network and try to get them um, on board with particular ways of organizing it. I mean, if we did that now, we have staff. At the time, we didn't have staff. Now we've got staff if we were to do that. I mean, that's us paying for staff to go work on the process of how a municipal advisory council would happen. Since all of the criteria seem like they're finance related, do you think that that might be something worth us doing? 
I, I certainly think that that's, that's one way to demonstrate activation of, of the power. Yeah. It, but I think you're right to focus in on the fact that the, that the primary uh, aspects, the, the primary areas where LAFCO is looking, and I laid this out on uh, page two of, of my memorandum, is that they want to see does the district have funding programmed for the services under each power, and is there a sufficient revenue stream to support the program, uh, program or programs as an ongoing concern? So if, if one of the policy directions from the board is to uh, provide uh, staff time to the creation of this MAC and to put together a plan, I mean, that's, that's certainly uh, another couple of steps along uh, the way towards showing the uh, LAFCO board or the commission that this was uh, that this power is being you know, activated. Obviously, it takes time to get things uh, moving and then implemented. Uh, I, you know, I, I won't speak on in terms of you were there as a as a commission member uh, about you know the the tenor of the board and the temperature of the board, uh, except to say that generally there seemed to be a, a more people on the commission who looked at. Uh, cooperation with providing an opportunity uh, for the district IBCSD to, to show that it was, it was moving forward uh, under each of the powers. So, you know, of course, you don't want to bank on that. So I would, in that case, I come back to the two financial uh, issues that Blackco is really looking at. Does it have, does the district have programming uh, funds and does it have a revenue stream to support it on an ongoing basis? Another somewhat concrete question I have. I'm um, sorry. Now having your memo come back with the with the, with um, modifications um, with our new knowledge, and I, I, I reread all the sections on the parking district. And so, what one question I have is is that we at least previously, and I, I, I assume still do, um, have an agreement with the county with relation to our control over a number of parking spots in the solar lot, um, if not a general administration. Um, a, um, responsibility with relation to the lot. Uh, is that something that maybe we could consider to have been acquiring parking spots? And we also are in negotiations with groups like the um, Safe Parking Program. I mean, maybe we're in a position where we could activate that parking power and start assigning people towards a parking commission um, already. Is that plausible? I, I think that some of those actions that you just mentioned could fall under the umbrella of the parking district, but I, I, you're correct to point out that there are a lot of other procedural requirements for for demonstrating activation and use of uh, power. And as you mentioned, having you know parking commission, um, you know having some of these other bodies that fill out you know the operations, but also having this board fit as the board of directors uh, ultimately of uh, the Isla Vista community or the Isla Vista parking district. Uh, I think having the, the the larger public meetings and reports to the board be one of those processes uh, that uh, will demonstrate the activation and use of this power. I, I want to also point out that 61250 also indicates that the district cannot acquire uh, other types of property without permission. So in the instance of whatever agreement might exist with the county, uh, I think it would be a little bit easier to put that through the uh, the strictures of, of the parking district law and have it conform uh, a little bit more easily uh, because we've already got some type of existing uh, arrangement and it's just a matter of putting it through and and you know hitting the different points that are laid out in the par parking district law in terms of any future. Uh, assignment of parking spaces as that's laid out in the parking district uh, uh, act it's it's going to be important that we follow each of those steps and a prerequisite really is going to be uh, making sure that you you've got these sub these subordinate bodies in place to make the decisions as it's laid out I, I also want to point out that the parking district law it, it goes it was enacted in like the 1940s or the 1950s so it's a little bit cumbersome it's very bureaucratic, uh, but the intention is clear of having 
public participation at different levels. Uh, so that's something that the board should keep in mind as it's going about making these policy decisions. I, I think we're on our way and we have some of the, the building blocks to put the parking district power into play. But I do think we have a number of administrative hurdles uh, that we need to clear before I would feel confident in saying, you know, we've got enough. Thank you. I'm going to go over to Director Thurlow. Um, yeah, as a as a liberal Democrat, I, I, I don't want to be anti-government here, but let me say that, you know, we may not need all these powers. And one of the powers that I think is going to be incredibly difficult for us as a community services district to tackle is parking. And so I don't think... On the other hand, we need to get a MAC and we need to get a planning commission. And, and I think that, uh, th that's, that those two are going to take us 14 months of all of our attention and all of our time. And I, I don't think it's a, um, a horrible loss if somehow we, we lose our power over parking, because frankly, I don't Parking here in Isla Vista is going to be a regional solution, and I'm not sure that, you know, talk about taking heat on COVID. Wait till we issue parking stickers. So anyway, that would just be my thing is, um, you know, if I think, and the, the, the other piece of it is, I think this is a huge opportunity for us, and Craig is there listening, to build a good working relationship with LAFCO. And spend the next 14 months really working closely with that to show them that this is a serious self-government agency and we're not power hungry and and LAFCO if you want to solve Isla Vista's parking problem please we invite you anyway thanks thanks uh, director Thurlow director Bertrand Yes, thank you. Um, well, first off, thank you so much to Ross for providing just such excellent information throughout this process. Thank you to our staff. Um, President Brandt, you did a fantastic job representing us at the commission and um, speaking with the news media about this as well. And regardless of questions about the motivations of when this is timed, um, I'm feeling good. I'm feeling that we have so much to be proud of. Um, we provided a great service to our constituents over the past uh, three years, uh, from our safety station program to the interpersonal violence program, uh, to our survivor resource center, those programs focused on public safety, we've been there for our community members. Um, from supporting our homeless community through providing space to United Way to have a um, homeless entry, homeless uh, coordinated entry system location in Isla Vista, as well as our Isla Vista Beautiful program where we hire people experiencing homelessness to go out and clean up our community. That's been a huge success. Um, from our community programs where we partnered with Isla Vista Youth Projects to provide services for youth and families in Isla Vista. Fantastic program that re reached so many people. These are just a few examples of how we've made a tangible positive difference in the lives of Isla Vista residents. Um, so I'm really excited for, um, as we move forward in the years to come, how we tell that story and how we work to continue to provide a great level of service. Um, one thing I did recognize with the hearing is that there were some um, public commenters from the community who uh, may not agree with the statement I just made. And a number of those folks, if not all of them, are people who oppose to the creation of this district. There are people who are trying to litigate the same concerns that they had back in 2014 uh, when they were not interested in a local government that would be represented by the people who live in Isla Vista, especially young people, a diverse board, um, and they're uncomfortable with decisions being made by people who are younger, people who are renters, uh, people who may be students, people who are working class. Um, just some examples of what I see as really strengths of our board and strengths of our government, being a government by the people of Isla Vista. So I am a little bit concerned about those public comments, um, but at the same time, I invite these people to reach out to us. Um, I've never gotten an email from any of these folks 
And um, it's a small interest group that even though we don't agree, I do want to help. Um, I want to hear their ideas for how we make Isla Vista better. Um, and I want to work together. Um, so to summarize it all, I, I am really proud of the work that we have been doing and I'm excited for what we continue to do. Um, and I agree with George that uh, we do want to work well with LAFCO. Uh, where I disagree with George is parking is at the top of my list, uh, not so much a Mac. Uh, but anyway, looking forward to continuing in this process. Thank you for those comments, Director Bertrand. Um, I am seeing a hand from Director Freeman. I just wanted to note in case anyone else didn't appreciate this fact that one of the uh, negative comments, um, which uh, even said that they do not see any benefits or areas in which the Alavista Community Service District has acted since its inception is from a, a new member of the board of the Alavista Recreation and Park District. Yes, uh, I recognize um, that too, and I was super disappointed in that comment. Yeah, I agree, and I appreciated the comments from uh, Commissioner of LAFCO, uh, well, alternate, and then voting uh, member Das Williams uh, to point out that uh, this group of people comprises well less than 1% of the population in Isla Vista, and uh, while uh, I think a lot of the work that our board has done over the past um, four years has really been centered around trying to serve some of the underserved populations. The first and foremost, I believe, which is long-term uh, renters in our community. Um, the long-term homeowner community is both very small and historically uh, has had an outsized uh, amount of political power that has contributed negatively to the development and the solving of community problems. Um, so if there are disagreements there, um, I think I agree with Director Bertrand's sentiment of let's have the discussion, um, but uh, it's not something that really impacts uh, my philosophy as a board member uh, as we continue to try and provide the services that we are mandated to by the voters. Director Bertrand. Thank you, that, that's right, President Brandt. And one thing you mentioned there um, was the, the permanent homeowner um, group. And I just wanna go on the record saying, uh, throughout our work in Isla Vista, we've had this rift where we're, we're being told that it's students versus the permanent residents. And, I just think it's so important as we're moving forward that we recognize that permanent residents uh, look a lot different. Uh, it's not just old people who own homes. It's also me, it's also you, Spencer. Um, it's also new members of our board that are coming on, people who are younger, people who do rent, and people who are investing a lot of time, a lot of energy and our heart in this community. Um, so I do just wanna point that out because it's far too often that we see um, in these discussions, people talking about the long-term residents versus the student community, where in fact, uh, there's a lot of people in the middle um, and many of us um, are invested in this community. Thank you for those comments, Director Bertrand. I could not agree more. And I'm very proud of my status as a long-term resident in Isla Vista, even though I don't own a home. Any other comments from members of the board? Uh, I see uh, one from Father John and then one from Director. You know, again, forgive me for getting a little religious, citing um, uh, something from another source, but um, uh, you, you all, you young ones, let no one despise your youth. You have been an example of community service in this district. And uh, for whatever time I have been here, um, I have witnessed that and I will continue to tell that story. Thank you. Thank you, Father John. Thank you for your sagely words as always, Father John. Director Geitz, you're up. Uh, 
Uh, Director Geis, I'm not sure if you're talking, but we can't hear you. Hey, so I just wanted to maybe get a little advice from Ross or, you know, just share this with the board. And talking to, you know, Supervisor Hartman, one of the things she brought up on the financed operations of an area planning commission, and she sat on a planning commission for a long time, it said, well, usually you want a strong community plan first. And to get that strong community plan, you usually enact a community advisory committee to help you finalize that plan. And then you have a, an area planning commission that is using that plan to make decisions in the community. So to think that we could even get, if, if, you, lit, if you say, well, if we do a community advisory committee, is that a good enough step that we retain the opportunity to eventually get an area planning commission? Or is, it, is, is this financed operations of a planning commission say, we're just gonna sit five people in a room and somehow they're gonna make, you know, planning decisions. And, uh, you know, we, we have a big community plan that's probably now out of date that needs some kind of a review and update and uh, to get to like the area planning commission. So to, to, to retain that power within 14 months um, just seems like we need a good plan to get there, even though we might not formally have an area planning commission, or maybe we could use the county's planning, current planning commission to have a couple of meetings a year that's just focused on IV and moving that stuff forward. So I think we're going to have to be a little bit innovative because I think when we, whoever formed the, the, you know, the operations here probably meant when they did the area planning commission that it would be more encompassing. It would be the leadership body to do these other things. And so anyway, just, I don't know if Ross has any comments for that. I, I don't because it's a lot of that is going to end up being policy discussions and policy decisions that the board ultimately uh, will have to make. In, in terms of what is going to satisfy LAFCO, I, I'm, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I'll, I'll invite your attention back to page two, where we, we meaning Jonathan, myself, uh, these points were the focus of our discussions um, with the, the interim uh, executive officer for, for LAFCO. They're looking at funding for, pro, uh, for program services and insufficient revenue streams. Beyond that, it really is kind of an open question as to what other types of metrics they may use, which was one of the criticisms that we raised uh, with them uh, earlier this year when the MSR discussion was, was kicked off. In terms of practical ways, yeah, there are lots of different ways I think that the board can go about this, but as, as, as a fundamental step, it's, I, I see the next, uh, the fundamental step that happens next is, is assigning priorities to uh, these areas, which are, is a policy decision for the board to make. And I think after we have an idea of how the board wants to prioritize the, uh, the continuing funding and existence of programs that are already off the ground, but also more importantly, expanding you know, attention and time and money into the, into the uh, less utilized uh, services, uh, that will lay out uh, a good roadmap for what we do. And then we can prioritize uh, time, attention and money to accordingly, and then uh, I, I think uh, one of the board members made a very good comment and observation, and I, I will share that many of you know I'm also a general district counsel for the Los Olivos Community Services District. And what Los Olivos' board has done is to take a proactive approach to their communications with LAFCO because they have an annual review process by LAFCO whereby they have to demonstrate that they're making progress towards you know, their goals and why they were created. Otherwise, mm -hmm. they risk losing their funding. 
So a proactive approach, as was suggested by members of this board, in cooperating and coordinating with LAFCO uh, probably will reveal uh, more information on some of the less uh, concrete or more amorphous metrics that may be out there that they may be looking for above and beyond the core uh, uh, principles of the MSR, which is having the funding uh, in place and having a dedicated revenue stream. So laying out the policy goals is, is absolutely the first step. And then we can get into the specifics of the processes and the procedures and the nuts and bolts for how we're going to do that. Thank you for that, Ross. Uh, and I do want to be mindful to stay on agenda since we're not agenda to talk about the specifics of any of these services right now. We're, we're talking about the municipal service review update. Um, so with that in mind, uh, do any other members of the board uh, have anything else to share on the municipal service review update? All right. Um, do any of the members of the public have comment on the municipal service review update? Yeah, I do. Um, I'm probably the only person uh, making public comment, which is pathetic, but uh, you already know who I am. Nobody knows who you are or that they are paying a tax to finance you. I'm the only person offering public comment. You received emails from me and never replied. You were hiring an expensive lawyer from Riverside who falsely stated that your MSR was in 2024. We pay for him to stay at hotels and eat at brophies. You hired homeless to perform your municipal services, and we now have an exploding homeless population. You are not addressing graffiti abatement in an organized or competent manner. Your provider, quote, does not own a power washer. You are substituting an app for competent municipal management. You spent money on a community center you do not actually have. You are not operating a library. Your tenant mediation program is a ruse. Your own numbers show that it is pathetic. Much of what you do is duplicious. We already pay for those services. Now, parking, give me a break. Right now you can park an IV. Why? Because UCSB's dorms are empty and UCSB's employees aren't parking here during the day. Do a survey, figure it out and realize why the undemocratically appointed member of your board says, oh my God, we can't deal with parking, it's too hard. Come on, guys, take a breath here. Look around. That's all I have to say. Thank you for your comments. And uh, while I usually don't respond, I do want to offer uh, if you need any tech support when it comes to using our app, uh, I'm super happy to come over and help you learn how to use it. Any other comments from members of the board? You want me to reply to that? Uh, you, you I want? sure as hell have used your app. Uh, why do you think <laughs> I've tested your app? I waited an entire year for some graffiti to be looked at. I have actually looked at who is reporting on your app. You stated 600 last time and there's 400. And a lot of those haven't even been fulfilled. You were trying to use an app to do work. You need a manager who walks the sidewalks and actually looks at this himself. We have very few sidewalks here. They should all be swept for the amount of money you're paying. You are not doing the job. I am somebody who knows about that work. I live here. I walk the streets here. I see the graffiti yeah. that is not being removed. So no, no, no. Don't tell me about how to use an app. I have been using it, I've tested it, and I have pulled all the data from your app and looked at it already, okay? I don't have time, or I could very easily go on ad nauseum about that data, because I've actually looked at it and then walked around and looked at the results. You need a manager, a real manager, not a Politico. Thank you for your comments. Um, Jonathan, just for the record, um, how does our graffiti abatement program work? Is that essentially what we do? We employ people to abate graffiti and go around and look for it? Yes, they, uh, they're they hired. They do United Way through the Isle of Vista Beautiful program. They're equipped with smartphones. They, they, ha they have two jobs. One is to do the monitoring, going around town to find instances of graffiti and 
the other half of the job is to clean them up and others like trash pickup, things that people submit to us. So there have been over 400 uh, graffiti instances removed in Isla Vista just in the first year and a half of our program. Thank you for that, Jonathan. I do want to say too, um, I don't want if any of our staff members are on the call to feel that the work of our graffiti abatement team uh, is being disparaged or that they are personally being disparaged because they previously experienced homelessness. Uh, I think that that's an incredibly important aspect of our program. Uh, and it's, it's very sad to hear this rhetoric from uh, members of our uh, Director Bertrand. Yeah, thank you. Um, as the public commenter has demonstrated, it's much easier to whine and complain about things than to actually make a difference in our community. Um, I really encourage um, folks who, who do want to make this positive difference to engage in this work with us. It's so easy to just complain. And I mean, frankly, it gets old um, when you make the same complaints over and over and don't look at what's happening. Um, as I've made clear throughout my tenure on the board, my number one concern is public safety. Um, and that's something that's personal to me for a number of reasons. And I'm especially proud of what we've done on the public safety front over the past few years with our partners at UCPD. Um, we're making a difference in the community. Uh, I, I actually, I feel bad for um, paying so much attention to this speaker because it's legitimizing or making it look like uh, I view his concerns as legitimate. Uh, but anyway, back to what I was saying before, I'm really proud of the services we've been providing and look forward to continuing to do so. Thank you, Director Bertrand. All right, so with that, I'm going to bring it back to the board. There are one other public comment. Sorry, Spencer. Uh, Deputy Schroeder, not related to the last uh, public speaker. I just uh, I, I wanted to address Ethan's comment earlier, or Director Bertrand, I'm sorry. Um, but he said old people that own homes, and I've been uh, living in the community for 35 years and working here for seven years, and um, there are a lot of young homeowners that uh, contact me about issues. And so I just wanted to address that there, there are young homes out there as well. And I thought that was kind of a, a statement that maybe should be corrected or, or retracted because I, I, I get corrected a lot and say, I feel it's my duty to do the same. Yes, thank you uh, for, for doing your duty. Um, there are approximately uh, 50 homeowners in Isla Vista. Uh, we're rooting for them. We're glad that we have homeowners in this community. And a few of them are on the younger side. And um, I'm so glad that they uh, are able to own a home in this community. Uh, I'm happy that they're our neighbors. Uh, what I did say before is that uh, a lot of times the challenge uh, in these discussions, a false narrative that's put out is that it's this large quote unquote uh, permanent resident population, even though many of us who are on the younger side are permanent residents. Uh, it's the permanent residents quote unquote versus the young people. And um, that's, just not not the case but thanks for your comments thank you for that comment uh deputy schroeder okay um is there any formal action needed jonathan on this item i think you're on mute no the next action is going to be when we have a retreat and start putting out plans and priorities so start thinking about that. That's the action. It's homework for the board to start thinking about it. Well, we will be looking forward to that. All right. Uh, next, uh, we're going to go to uh, reports. I'm going to skip over closed session. We'll do that at the very end. Um, so first, reports from members of the board. Uh, do any members of the board have reports? Director Pre Uh, so if nothing else, because I mentioned earlier in the meeting, um, many of you are aware that I have equipment in the community center with relation to providing internet access and um, uh, through taking it from the community um, services district as well as my office across the street. And at various times I've gotten approached by, for example, some local churches, which I hadn't gotten around to providing some internet access, um, uh, working with them because other things had come up in my life. But then I started to free up. The park district had been very interested for a while. 
and um, now they've started to free up. They were they were um, really busy with the encampment policy, and so now I've been approached by some staff from the park district. I've also now been approached by people at the park district and myself have been approached by people from Pardal Center and Tenants Union, and now Deanna's approaching me from other places, and so I'm finally setting up um, a meeting to talk about Isla Vista Community Internet and look at what I had already been doing and opportunities to go forward and different agencies that could be involved in actually stewarding it, because it's not... I don't do it as like my company or anything like I have I just I just do it because I think it's fun to do so it's not like I mean the goal is to try to get is to be like someone's actually doing it officially uh, and I'm um, looking at what our options are and and um, things like that so if anyone's interested in being a part of that meeting contact me in the very near future I'm going to be sending out information on how to start scheduling that meeting um, all the people I've already mentioned uh, um, are, are um, interested in on board and coming to that meeting so Thank you, Director Freeman. Uh, other reports from members of the board? Uh, Director Thurlow. Yeah, let me give you my quick report here. Thank you for recognizing my uh, 29th birthday. Um, and I just want to say this. Uh, I can't think of a greater group of people to spend my birthday with than this board. Uh, you're an inspiration. I apologize that at times I'm pretty cantankerous and impatient, but I really want to tell you how much uh, I have enjoyed working with you all. Thank you. Thank you, Director Thurlow. I can say the feeling is uh, mutual and we appreciate your shenanigans as always. Happy 29th birthday. Um, okay, I'll give my report, um, I'll keep it brief really to uh, just, I share that I've uh, been contacted by the new police chief of the University of California Police Department, Alex Yao, and uh, I'm looking forward to meeting with Chief Yao next week uh, to talk about how we can continue our partnerships that we have with UCPD. Uh, as, as our board knows, uh, we have a contract for interpersonal violence investigation services that are trauma informed. In addition to that, we have uh, the contract for our community service officers, uh, which are deployed on Friday and Saturday nights, and which are now redeployed. They're back from their COVID hiatus. Uh, at least I saw them when I was walking past them a couple of nights ago and was excited to see that. Um, but I'm just really excited uh, to meet with him. Uh, I'm glad um, that uh, they're happy has been uh, uh, this new leadership there, and uh, we'll look forward uh, to uh, hopefully bringing back uh, additional partnerships in the future. All right, um, next we have reports from committees. Any committee reports? All right, I think that that is no committee reports today. Okay, um, we'll go to district council for a report. Uh, just, just a quick update, uh, Mr. President. I, I think in, in light of the fact that the district is embarking on uh, as much of, of a, a legal and administrative campaign as it is a public uh, relations campaign for as it goes, how it goes about activating and, and fulfilling um, the requirements for all of these different powers. Uh, and it's in a position of using finite resources uh, very uh, smartly uh, and, and having to uh, face a lot of scrutiny for where, where the different tax uh, bearer dollars go. Uh, from time to time, I think it's important to remind uh, those members of the board who may be newer or those members of the community who are just turning in, uh, at least as far as my contract is concerned, for the first six or seven months, um, I basically worked for free. And then after that, uh, we negotiated a below market rate uh, that's lower than any municipal services law firm uh, who could have provided services in uh, the area. I'm also a UC Santa Barbara graduate. I graduated in 1995, so I have a lot of familiarity with the community. And one of the features that uh, I pass on as a cost savings to, to the community is that whenever possible, I, I split uh, work that I do uh, that overlaps between my representation of IBCSD and Los Olivos. Uh, back when I was traveling, there was a mention of hotel bills. Uh, the, the district does not pay all of that unless I'm only up for a specific IVCSD uh, matter. 
typically uh, that is a cost that ends up being split. Uh, travel ends up being split. Uh, so I'm constantly uh, aware of how my time is being spent uh, so that the district has as many dollars as possible to go towards fulfilling the different requirements. Uh, whenever possible, I group uh, IBCSD into group projects for multiple clients to reduce the effective rate down below, sometimes as low as 30 or $40 for work that takes anywhere from 15 to 25 hours to, uh, to compile. So uh, I, I definitely hope uh, that the, uh, the community is aware of the, uh, the judicious way that the, the board watches out for how I spend money. And uh, certainly that is a function of the fact that I'm also very uh, much keenly aware that every time I'm doing something, I have to be aware of how much it's costing uh, the taxpayers in the community. So uh, I am, it, is, it is always a goal to deliver the best quality uh, municipal services legal uh, advice that, that we possibly can at the lowest cost that we can. Uh, and I certainly uh, know for a fact that there are no other municipal law firms in California uh, who could provide the level of service we do at the, at the rate that we provide. Uh, so I happen to live in Riverside. My office is in Riverside. I live closer than that. And uh, in the end, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a good deal that we end up passing on uh, because I represent also uh, Los Alivos. Uh, and if the opportunity arises to have a, a Central Coast office, uh, that's certainly something I would explore. And of course, any cost uh, reduction or cost savings that come from that uh, we would pass on to our clients uh, all along the Central Coast. So just a reminder, that's it, thank you. Thank you, Ross, and thank you for your second to none legal service as always. You've been an integral member of our team from the start and uh, we would not have been able to uh, get to where we are today without you, so thank you. Lastly, we have a 6.4 report from general manager. Great, thank you. Um, I think a lot of my report was featured as uh, agenda items from what we've worked on the last two weeks. I mean, it seems like a long time ago now, but the week after the last board meeting through the festival was pretty much only festival, uh, getting that ready. So that's uh, that was a lot of our workload since the last meeting, but the audit is done. That's great news. We have our third audit complete. It's pretty much a totally clean audit all the past suggestions for improvements and in internal controls uh, have been recognized to be implemented and only one is still in progress that we really don't have control over, which is getting uh, new information from the utility companies on uh, the taxes they're collecting for us. So can't force them to do it. Maybe, maybe we can look into how we can uh, create more requirements there to uh, meet the audit, but we'll, we'll get to that when we have our audit presentation on December 8th. So please look forward to that. Um, but we, we did it, we passed. We, we did a great job three years in a row now, uh, which will help us get a credit card for the district to help just our services. Um, another thing is if you could please uh, contact me maybe after the meeting or even like right now uh, with a quick email about your personal you know, vacation plans during the holidays or you know, I know we're on Zoom, but you might have personal things going on where you don't wanna take a break for a five hour meeting when we weren't originally scheduled to do that, um, just so that we can plan the retreat. I'm thinking either early January or mid December, but I don't wanna do mid December if uh, we can't get the entire board um, on the same page for that. So please let me know your general avail availability for vacations and, and all that uh, at the end of the year. Uh, one, more, one more thing to note for the public is, uh, and I think Sienna is on our call still, right now, well, no, she's not, but um, we made the decision at our compost collective team meeting yesterday to stop operations from November 20th through January 11th due to COVID-19. Um, a lot of our staff are not available. They're gonna be going home to their, you know, celebrate Thanksgiving and not come back to Isla Vista until January. And uh, we're, we're hearing a lot of that from our participant houses. So. That program is you know, gonna be closed for almost two months again, uh, like it was at the you know, beginning of the pandemic. And, but what, one thing that will still be going on is uh, we're gonna be doing the food on wheels to divert potential food waste uh, for, as, into donations.
before people leave town for two months or so. So that's starting up uh, hopefully on November 15th um, at the, you know, at the food co-op and the bagel cafe as distribution points or as collection points. And then the last thing, the most exciting, I think, is um, today the Santa Barbara Board of Supervisors appointed in lieu of election Ethan Bertrand and Marcus Aguilar for four-year terms uh, on our board of directors. And those terms will begin on the first Friday of December. So month, about a month, a little less than a month from now. And the race for the two-year seat on our board, it appears that uh, Catherine Flaherty has won the election and that election will be certified uh, before the swearing in, but um, her vote totals have 80% in her favor. So uh, we've, we've got our new board. I think we have a uh, future director, Marcos Aguilar, it's on the call with us today. So some next steps on that. Uh, first is that we're going to have a ceremony for our outgoing board members. So today is technically our last board meeting um, with Father John and Christy as voting members of the board. But we do want you all to be there next on December 8th. Uh, we're going to have a farewell, a farewell ceremony, a resolution, <clears throat> a swearing in session, and pass the torch on to the new uh, board members. So it'll be a good uh, transition meeting. And one of the to-do items to get done between now and December 8th and you know, through the end of the year as well is to do some orientation sessions for the new board members to educate them on different parts of the district and answer questions and see you know, how we can support them in being uh, good directors. If there's any training that's needed that we can uh, provide through CSDA, we have a budget for that. So that's one of our next steps. And if anyone has any other ideas on how we can support our new board members, let me know. You know some others that I've heard about or experienced or things like assigning a board mentor so if you have anything, let me know, but I'm going to, you know, we, Deborah and I will work on developing some you know, information about the district that already exists to help them get acquainted and ready to do their jobs most effectively. So that's my report. Thank you for that report, Jonathan, and uh, congratulations to Ethan and Marcos uh, for your terms and uh, to tentative or preliminary congratulations to Catherine as well uh, for her election. And uh, I'm looking forward to giving some very well due praise and honor to Christy and Father John for all of the work and commitment uh, that you put in to help our district succeed over these past uh, four years. All right. Um, lastly, uh, we're gonna jump back to item six, uh, I'm sorry, item five. Uh, this is closed session conference with real property negotiators under government code section 54956.8. This is for 970 and 976 in Marcadero del Mar. Um, negotiators are myself, uh, Bob Geist, Vice President, uh, Jonathan Abood, uh, Ross Trindle, District Council, and we are negotiating with uh, the County of Santa Barbara under negotiation price in terms of payment. Um, and then the second item under uh, 5.2 is conference of legal counsel anticipated litigation initiation of litigation pursuant to government code section 54956.9 subsection D subsection 4. Uh, one item. Um, so uh, I think that we'll have Jonathan put everyone who's on the board in the waiting room and uh, then we will put you back in once closed section is complete. And Mr. President, I'll be recusing from this item. Thank you. Thank you, Director Bertrand. Okay, back into open session. All right. All right, this is everyone for open session? Yes. All right, we're reconvening open section. Uh, Council, is there any reportable action? Thank you, Mr. President. On item 5.1, conference with real property negotiators, uh, the board did take action in closed session to resume, resume negotiations with the County of Santa Barbara regarding a combined uh, agreement for 970 and 976 in Barcadero del Mar in order to uh, set specifics to fix price and terms. The vote of the board was five uh, board members in favor, none against, 
uh, one recusal, which was Director Bertrand, and one absence, which was uh, Director Nguyen. With respect to 5.2, conference with legal counsel, anticipated litigation, uh, no reportable action uh, occurred. Thank you, counsel. We'll now go to item seven, our next uh, meeting date, and uh, that is going to be December 8, 2020 at 6 p.m. right here on Zoom. Uh, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So move. Second. Made by Thurlow, seconded by Freeman. Is there any public comment? Any further discussion? All right, Jonathan, you want to call the roll? Yep. Uh, Brent, Freeman, yes. Bertrand, Hi. Hedges. Yes. Thurlow. Yes. Guys. Yes. Great. That's it. Thanks, everyone. Have a safe Thank holiday. You. We'll see you soon. Okay. Thank you. Do well. Well done. Good Thank luck. You. Thank you for everything. Happy we'll birthday, Director Thurlow. Last official.